some open time for public comment. So um, uh, members of the public may address the board for up to three minutes. We're not really strict on that. The board can have no discussion on this. So um, any of you would like to address the board? Now is the time. Yes, sir. Is there a, a Can you have a yeah, it'd be best if you could stand here and, and if you want to um, give the name. Sure, my name is Peter Hobble, Marksburg, 20 Wait, 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 wait. Are we going? Are we rolling? Okay, go ahead. I have a private home market situation. We purchased our house on 20 in October 2012. We identified at that time through a sewer inspection that we share common sewer lateral uh, with property at 16 Ella. There are five units on lateral. The sewer inspection uh, further identified that the common lateral was in poor condition and required replacement. Our neighbors declined to replace the line, so we replaced our three private connections to the lateral at that time. In November 2014, there was a plumbing issue at one of the units at 16 Olive. While we were out of town, we were not informed of the issue by our neighbors. Their plumber came onto our property, cut open the sewer line, and left it open for one week with sewage spilling into our property. Upon learning of the issue, we immediately notified Ross Valley Sewer District and have worked with the Sanitary District to try to identify a solution. However, we need further guidance and clarification of Ordinance 66 to determine the most feasible solution. Number one, we have requested that the Sanitary District inspect the full line in accordance with Ordinance 66, Section 7, Part 1, which requires an inspection upon the occurrence of an overflow or malfunction, lateral failure, or lack of maintenance. Our public health threat. We feel all three of these are relevant given the circumstances in November 2014. Number two, we would like to understand what enforcement actions the Ross Valley Sewer District can take against a homeowner whose lateral does not pass inspection. What can be done to compel a homeowner to maintain a line which has had a malfunction? Number three, we require further clarification on who is responsible for repair of common line. Given guidance by Ross Valley Sewer District staff, we determined that we should not repair the existing pipe, but should create our own line so that we are in accordance with code. We applied for and were approved for the grant program for our replacement since it's expired. However, our neighbor's pipe would still be on our property. Our understanding is that Ross Valley Sewer District may consider the portion of that pipe on our property our responsibility, even if we no longer use it. I'm sure you can appreciate that we cannot spend the money to create a separate pipe on our property and still have a risk of responsibility for a pipe we don't use and is not being adequately maintained. We have small children and pets and cannot risk having an open sewer line on our property again. Our opinion is that our neighbor and, and us should have each our own separate property, our own separate, our own pipe on our property. We have demonstrated that we are willing to do our part to upgrade this lateral and we need to ensure that we take the best approach. However, we need guidance from us, God. Thank you. Anybody else wish to, hopefully staff can go over here. Yeah, I don't know if this is on the agenda, but it relates to your um, uh, giving up your control over the uh, pipeline going to San Quentin. Uh, my name is Clayton Smith. I come from Mount Hill Valley. Hill Valley. Yeah. And uh, the reason why I feel motivated to come here is because this, I think, is an issue that transcends uh, just a parochial situation as might exist here in uh, Ross Valley. Uh, the potential uh, for the development of San Quentin, I think, is an issue that uh, is going to have impacts for everybody who lives in the county. And I think that before uh, the veto power that you currently have over what might transpire out there in San Quentin is given up, that um, a larger county-wide information and discussion of this issue should occur. At this point, I think most people in Marin County have absolutely no idea how far along this project has uh, been uh, moving, and particularly in light of Mr. Huffman's uh, conversations recently on the topic that are getting a little more exposure. But I think that this is something that you need to, and, and the, when the excuse of 
cost savings is brought up, I think when you think of the consequences of this, the overall cost to the rest of us in this county, I think you ought to bear in mind that perhaps those costs that you're thinking that are so high now are really rather small when you consider the impact, the negative impact that the development, the hyper-intensive development of that peninsula would, would have on the rest of the economy, not just the economy where I live, but actually even the economy of all the businesses that are in this particular valley and in the community that you're serving. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Yeah, hi, I'm Peter Hensel from Corte Madera, and uh, I don't mean to be disrespectful of Mr. Uh, Gaffney, because I do respect people in public service, but I did read in the IJ uh, in February that you had worked for RSVD for the, since 1970s up to 2007. Is that correct? Yes. Well, I, yes. Okay. Uh, and then... Uh, but you haven't worked for them since then. But you have been working for Central Marin Sanitary Agency up until 2013. I would feel a lot more comfortable about your ability to be, be impartial and represent the interests of Ross Valley Sanitary if uh, Central Marin Sanitary Agency wasn't the last agency that you uh, gave advice to. Um, that's my comment. And, and also, I would like to bring up what uh, is a letter from the Fair Political Practices Commission um, that apparently they delved into whether you not or not you have a conflict of interest, and it says uh, no because you don't have an interest in Central Marin Sanitary Agency. Well, I understand you were probably on retainers, but you were giving them financial advice because that's what you do. But then they, they close by saying. Um, there is no evidence that participation in the settlement of a lawsuit between Ross Valley Sanitary and Central Marine Sanitation would affect the value of Bartle Wells. I mean, that strikes me as a very bizarre statement because what, what is at issue is here is whether or not you can correctly represent uh, Ross Valley Sanitary. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Good evening. My name is Joyce Britt. I'm from Mill Valley, and I'm here tonight as a citizen of Marin to um, speak to a couple of issues. Uh, first, the matter of unintended consequences to which Mr. Smith referred. Um, unintended consequences in the sense of uh, transfer of your asset may very well result in growth that most of the citizens of Marin do not want to see. Another matter is, <clears throat> with respect to the lawsuit, um, I think that in view of the comments, I should say the opinion of the trial judge uh, who decided the matter of the summary judgment motion, uh, I think both that and the other, I and other issues which relate to conflict of interest that it would be absolutely best for there to be an open forum for discussion of these matters. Right now, our county has a lot of clouds over it with respect to public participation and public awareness, public knowledge, public notice. So, you know, if you think that the matter will be closed by a settlement, unfortunately, matters of con conflict of interest uh, rarely are. And so I think all of you need to take a very close look at the legacy that you want to let, leave as a result of your years of public service for which I and I'm sure everybody needs to really congratulate you. Next. <clears throat> Nancy Okada, I'm from San Anselmo, and I've been to previous four years. And I want to, once again, go around on transparency, encourage you to put this business out into the public's uh, 
you we need to all be able to see what's going on in terms of any negotiations that are going on between the new Central Sanitary and San Quentin. Uh, there is precedence for this. We have provided you with that information. I believe some attorney that is helping us, as well as I know I've talked to several other attorneys. And um, we really do need to be able to understand what you're negotiating and how you're going to settle this negotiation if you are going to settle it in public. Um, it would probably be much better to go to better binding arbitration as has been recommended by numerous people who are far more knowledgeable than myself. And uh, anyhow, that's what I would like to encourage you to not hold the, pub the closed session, but hold it out in public so that we may all see what's going on. And um, I would also seriously think about your um, reevaluating your legal team because it seems as though there have been many missteps along the way. So thank you very much. Thank you. Next. Carol Page, San Antonio. I object to the use of the closed session to prevent public scrutiny of the actions of this board. This is an improper ploy. It is abusive, irresponsible, and gives a strong impression you have something to hide. One person settling the future of this district behind closed doors is repugnant. On March 18th, you conducted an illegal closed session. Additionally, any gift of public funds, board actions supporting violations of contractual agreements that results in higher rates and overdevelopment of the district service area are serious legal transgressions. I remind you, any vote taken to abandon resources of this district, impair function, and raise rates will be challenged. You have been offered options, alternative solutions, and been informed of legal impediments to a sellout settlement. Think carefully before you try to disenfranchise us who pay you to administer this district. I repeat this because you appear intent on your own agendas, agendas that are damaging to the future of Ross Valley Sanitary District. For example, meeting with those adversarial to this district while ensuring that those who advocate for the district either are outvoted or administratively silenced is a curious way for a board president to behave. Mr. Gaffney's repeated attempts to rebuff and stifle public inquiry while continuing to pursue his private agenda are beyond questionable. Fellow board members who share these ill-advised behaviors are equally vulnerable and liable. While CMSA, uh, when CMSA discussed and voted on the settlement, the two directors elected to represent us in that JPA were barred from either discussion or vote on the issue. Yet Mr. Gaffney decides the future with impunity as he meets privately with CMSA, the county, and perhaps others about whom we do not yet know. Who needs the former counsel to the State Fair Political Practices Commission? Mr. Gaffney has not been indicted merely asked to recuse himself from decisions where he may exercise bias. This is a reasonable request and expectation of any ethical representative, especially a public official participating in a governmental decision about matters arguably of material value to him. You have no attorney-client privilege here. You wrongfully invoke that claim. There is no Brown Act protection. Mr. Gaffney has breached confidentiality. The privilege is lost. Your, in, your attorney is informed of the deficiencies on which you rely. No trial date has been set for this litigation, but you are inviting another lawsuit. Binding arbitration is better than being sued again. The district has been cautioned by the courts, state and federal water quality agencies, fiscal watchdogs, and residents. There are consequences when you interfere with performance of the district functions for which the public is paying. Politics and public disenfranchisement have overtaken Ross Valley Sanitary's rightful mission, and for that, you are culpable. Uh, uh, uh. Hi, Joan Bennett from Kentville. I've sent you numerous letters, and I hope you've had an opportunity to review them. 
And some of the highlights I want to mention that I that are contained in those letters. First of all, I know that you've been asserting that the attorney-client privilege prevents you from providing us with the terms of the settlement agreement. That's not true. If you wish to provide us with the terms of the settlement agreement, you may do so. There's no law that says that you may not. Uh, if you don't want to provide us with the documents that were generated by your attorneys to you, then provide us with the documents that were generated by the defendants and given to you that contain the proposed settlement terms. Provide us with those. Let us know what's contained in them. Second, if you don't do that, I would suggest that the attorney-client privilege has been waived by your conduct in this matter. The the, there were two PRAs that were sent to this district, uh, or no, excuse me, one to Ross Valley Sanitary District by Basha Crane and another by Gerald Page to CMSA. And the documents produced in response there are verified that what happened was that the, what I would call the Rice mediation was initiated by Director Daphne. It was not initiated by Ross Valley Sanitary District's attorneys. You proceeded with this mediation without any attorneys present. They were expressly excluded by agreement of all parties. That was the preference stated by all parties. Therefore, there were no attorneys present when these discussions at the so-called mediation were conducted. Therefore, the attorney-client privilege doesn't, does not uh, apply to any of the discussions and or documents that were produced at that mediation. Subsequent mediations, the entire series of the mediation, therefore produced those documents to us. If you're asserting that under the common interest doctrine that which is a part of the attorney-client privilege that you don't have to produce those as well you do there's no common interest among the defendants and ross valley sanitary district there's no overlapping interest between ross valley sanitary district and the defendants you're adversarial in nature therefore whatever was discussed at that mediation you must produce to us as well none of this was covered by the attorney-client privilege um, lastly, there was no confidentiality agreement produced in the PRA documents. It's typical, it's standard procedure that when you enter a mediation, all parties sign a confidentiality agreement. The purpose of which is to promote freedom of expression at the mediation so that no party feels inhibited that what I provide to a mediator may somehow get back to the other side if I don't want that information relayed. And yet, there's no confidentiality agreement by which you may prevent us from seeing the information as well. But lastly, based on all this, and it's been suggested numerous, numerous times in writing by me, by others, and it's been stated here tonight, probably the best resolution to this matter, if you don't want to incur more attorney's fees and costs at trial, is to enter an agreement for binding arbitration. And you may do so by which all sides will bear their own costs and attorney's fees, therefore you're not exposing yourself to paying for the other side's litigation costs. You may also agree to three arbitrators, three at your discretion, each side agrees on them. You won't get stuck with a judge you might object to. Everybody will be happy with the panel you select. It's quicker, it's cheaper, and it's also not subject to appeal. So there will not be protracted appellate procedures. There won't be the cost that you would incur with proceeding with appeals. So if you go to binding arbitration, my estimate is you'd have this finished within six months, period. No more costs, no more lawyers. It would be over with, and it would be a resolution that the public more than welcomes. And you take your risk whether you go to trial whether you go to arbitration, you could win, you could lose. It's inherent in the nature of litigation. Getting out of bed in the morning is inherently, <laughs> is inherently a dangerous proposition going out on the roads. That is life. This is litigation. It can get tough. It can get nasty. But it's the nature of the business. And that's the business to which you were elected to conduct on the public's behalf. And you've heard over and over and over again, either share the information with us and or proceed to binding arbitration. So on that note, that's it. Here, here. Here, here. Well, <clears throat> my name is Sid Baskin, and I only have one thing to say. I, I support Joan Bennett's recommendation for binding arbitration. Where's Joan? Thank you, Father. Sam Rebell. Uh, Kathleen Mulcahy, um, City Lexington. And I have to say,
postcard in the mail today, and I thought it was kind of um, serendipitous. It says um, to recalibrate, and it seems it just seems like that's what needs to happen here. We just need to take and adjust and take external factors into account to allow for comparison. And I feel as though we've been dragging this closed session and litigation for so long that you're doing yourself an even further disservice by not, you know, bringing us into the picture. That's all we in the Marin County area really want to be as a part of what's going on. And I, I will um, thank Mr. Bornstein and um, Mr. Norby for publishing the four pieces of documents that I had requested and put online in regards to um, our concerns over uh, Mr. Gaffney's um, potential conflict of interest. So that enabled us as um, ratepayers to look at that information and make some some input comments, and I think that's valid. Um, out of next door, uh, this uh, Corte Madeira council member on the CMSA board is also making you know some some discussion points, and and that's really helpful for us. Um, as someone had mentioned earlier, that Congressman uh, Hoffman has been you know starting to be more liberal in regards to talking about Sam Clinton. You know we. Your biggest fears are things that you'd rather tackle than to keep hiding. And I think, I don't know if there's things that are being hidden in the agenda or we don't know. So of course we all go to that place of, of fear and, uh, and maybe we don't need to be, but, but again, with this prolonged um, business, we really don't know what we're up against. Um, so I just wanted to, to chat a little bit about um, transparency in regards to what's been going on. We just haven't gotten a lot from you guys as regards to the, the management of the board except for just recently. But in order to get those four letters that um, got onto the website, um, we had to do a lot of meetings and asking and requesting and, uh, and challenging. And that's just part of what the, the election body is all about, is challenging and bringing forth that information. So um, Mr. Yaffe, I have in my hand you know, all for your um, public um, 700 forms. And so, in, in regards to transparency, you had mentioned a couple of meetings ago, um, you know, kind of touting that you were known to be, you know, quite um, visible in the community because of all the clients that you've had in the past. So I, I pulled out the list on, on the website of your, your business, and there's, you know, about 430. Um, and so we've got, you know, names like Association of Barry Governments and the California State Community Development and Central um, Marin County and Central Marin Sanitary Agency and the City of Larkspur and Richmond Redevelopment Agency and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and Port Madeira. Sand District Number 2 and East Bay Mud and it goes on and on and on. Interestingly enough, Ross Valley Sanitary District got, didn't make it on your list of 430, so that was interesting. But, but when you when you filed um, your candidacy in, um, in what was received in the Marin County Courts on March of 2014, um, you filed that you had uh, no reportable interest on the schedule. So, so you know, stated a couple meetings ago that, that you know, you truly were elected because you've got so much wealth and background. But you chose not to put it on your 700 board. So, I, I transparency again. I, we in Moran, we do much better with the truth than we not disclose. Um, and the second one, when you became an elected um, official, um, this was filed on July 20th of 2014. Um, again, you state when you were elected that you had no, you know, agency ties whatsoever. Um, and then we finally get a piece of information in regards to your annual um, renewal of your 700 forms in January 2015, which all of a sudden you, you begin to declare, you know, a variety of stocks, which are very common for everybody, but, but that you are also a principal um, at um, Bartlett Well Associates and that you um, are a third owner in the, the real estate that firm runs for. And that would be true in regards to your recent filing as well. So you, you do have a connection. Um, you do have a wealth of knowledge because on your the home page from your company you've got um, you know, financial development and rate 
sheets and bonds and all sorts of great things that you do bring to the table. Um, but I, I think just because I've been in Arthur Anderson for a good chunk of my life, um, that there's a little bit of playing that goes on with the letters that were provided to the public in regards to um, the background. It goes, uh, Mr. Gaffin reports that though he has retired as the principal of BWA, uh, he does occasionally consult, does occasional consulting work with the firm at an hourly base. So I looked at your um, statements, your invoice statements for CMSA um, back in 2013. I've got them all here. And, you know, your rate, um, you know, is of a principal and a partner in my previous firm, Arthur Anderson, you know, the 225, and then Jason is much lower at 135. But it's typical um, to bill at an hourly rate. That's just how it's done in the consulting firm. So when, so when the reports that we're talking about the uh, conflict of confidentiality and, and uh, conflict of interest, you know, your occasional consulting at an hourly rate, well, that is what consulting is about. So I would kind of argue that you're, you know, still really working for that particular company um, while sitting on this, on this board. Um, it also, um, in favor of yourself still being on this board and not influencing it in any way, I will say that it says here that BWA does, uh, does have current contractual relations, does not have current, current contractual relations. Um, but what I would argue to say, because it also uh, relates in several of the letters of indirect, so that's, I work for Bechtel as well. Um, so both in my situations with Bechtel and you know, working with government contracts, you know, you get a foot in the door you know, then it exposes you or your fellow, you know, other consultants that you work with an opportunity, along with a competitive uh, advantage. Um, so, so I, I, again, I feel that you're sitting on the board is, is a high question. I, I looked at the letter that was quite in depth in regards to the Political Reform Act, and it, um, in detail, stepped through all four steps. Um, and in step number one, it said you, you know, met that situation in step number two, it met that situation in step number three. But in step number four, it went into much detail about, um, you know, how you could uh, look in regards to the financial feasibility. And so it came down to um, confidentially until all parties of litigation. According, accordingly, I conclude that Mr. Gaffney does not have a disqualifying conflict of interest under the Code of Reform Act. And they did that in regards to because what we're doing um, that we're not allowed to hear, all this confidentiality, it's actually, they're staying, saying because we don't know what you're talking about and because it's confidential, that, um, that you're safe. And I find that kind of backwards because if we could hear what you were talking about, maybe you would be, but we don't know. So you're kind of cloaking yourself, uh, well, there's cloaking you under the confidentiality because we don't know if it has any bearing on the litigation. Um, and so we're just going to take the high road and say, well, it, maybe it doesn't. So we're going to let him carry on. I think us as customers would rather not have that. Okay. And I'll speed it along. And I'll get down to... Maybe you... Yeah, I'll wrap it up. Yeah. Um, so I'll just read from today's paper. Um, Mr. Spotwood did a nice little summary just of the audit findings of which I kind of looked at our audit report in regards to looking at the 700 forms and CMSA actually publishing their, their forms. And I think you're on their board as an alternate, so that would you know, look at that situation as well. Um, CMSA. CMSA is an alternate. Right, but he's your alternate, I believe. Yeah. All three are. Because oh, it says on the website that, um, right here, CMSA, CMSA, that Tom Gaffney is alternate Sanitary District number one. So, I mean, that's what their website says. Um, so, but but they have out there their um, you know code of interest. So all you know all um, alternate commissioners or line commissioners has to you know provide all those those things that are in the 700 form. So everything's really quite laid out. 
Um, but I'll just read this little thing that Mr. Um, Scott. Well, I, I think it's going on. How, how, much, how long is this going mm -hmm. Well, I guess you can read it all today. So he did a nice little sum up of just um, you know looking at the audit findings that have been going on in this board. And, and I think we as a public you know, have a lot of fear in what's going on. And I think if you bring it out into the open and not doing all these closed discussions on the regs for the property, we'd be a lot better off. Yeah. All right, thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Uh, my name is Susan Kirsch. I'm from the Valley, California. Um, I'll be really brief. I just want to speak in favor of John Bennett's proposal that this go to arbitration. And I'd like to just tie it in with, with some of the work that I've done in the community and in my professional life is consult with nonprofit organizations. And much of that work has been in the mental health field. And in the mental health field, there is just this principle that telling the truth and getting the truth out in as broad a way as possible always has a healing quality to it. And it feels like we're bombarded with things like the brain jury's last report about what's been happening in pension plans. And we know you've already gone through your own tough period with what's happened with the Ross Valley Sanitary District. So it's just encouraging you to be open to the public and let the public know and create really a new model for telling the truth, looking to see how we all face the truth, when, as we've had to do it individually in our own lives, we, when we don't exactly like what we've witnessed and seen, but the importance of our agencies, all of our agencies, beginning as they recommend in mental health services to bring forward the truth and look at it and know, you know, as the line in the movie was, yes, we can stand to face the truth. We can say, see the truth and we can emerge stronger by the fact that we've considered the truth. Okay. Um. Anyone else? Okay, well, thank you all. Um, well, I have a statement to make. I have Okay. Before the closed session. Um, at, at the last closed session on this issue, I made a presentation to, to our directors, to our board, and our attorneys, uh, and handed out maps and information uh, regarding uh, the service area of the Los Angeles Santa Cruz. And, and a state law that impacts uh, who, who may serve San Quentin Peninsula. Um, my, 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 my recommendations, my presentations was ignored. They were ignored. This is the official LAFCO map, the Lost Valley Wastewater Districts. This is basically a, a blow up of the map that was handed to, to, to our, our, our board members. That shows the San Quentin Peninsula clearly in the planning sphere of influence of the Ross Valley Sanitary District and the urban service area of the Ross Valley Sanitary District. A state law passed in 2001, and it's it's uh, uh, Government Code 56133. I, I'm, I'm really passionate about our business and what we're doing here and how we're trying to make amends with our communities. And at the same time, it's like the wheels are coming off the bus here on us. Um, I'm being advised by two attorneys, both attorneys you've never seen at any of these meetings. One is considered the foremost expert in Brown Act law, Brown Act violations, and public records law. The other is considered an expert in interpretation of government codes. So, you know, I, I look to our attorneys for help, and I get no help at all, so I have to go out to private counsel and get, and, and get, and get, get, get information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. According to this map, CMSA, Central and Sanitation Agency, cannot serve San Quentin. They've been in violation of state law for three years since they took over San Quentin State Prison. A, a, a quick glimpse of the law says, a city or district may provide new or extended services by contract or agreement outside of its jurisdictional boundaries only if the first request receives written approval from the commission in the affected county. And that's LAFCO law. 
I checked with LAFCO. CMSA has never gone to LAFCO to get approval for servicing the San Quentin Peninsula, either San Quentin State Prison or Point, or San Quentin Village. There's about 46 community homes out there separate from the There is an exception uh, uh, that, that if, that if, if two, two, or two governmental agencies make an agreement, they, it, they can work this out. Mm -hmm. Except there is a condition on that exception. And it's under Section E, it says, this section does not apply to contracts for the transfer of non potable or non-treated water. <laughs> sewage is non potable the attorney of the me, sewage is considered non potable and non-treated water. <laughs> Flat out, CMSA can't be on our side of the hill taking over the business here. <laughs> but our attorneys ignore that. They ignore that. LAFCO is a state agency here, operates in Marin. I guess we've never checked with LAFCO to see what's going on. They are currently, they currently have an ongoing study about sanitary districts and wastewater services and collections in Marin County. Lo and behold, we never knew that. Our staff never checked with LAFCO to see what was going on. They are going to complete their study in fiscal year 2015-16. They hope to have the results out in January of 16. It includes wastewater services, collection and treatment for uh, Los Galinas Valley Sanitary District, San Rafael Sanitation District, CMSA, Larchburg, Court Madera, and the Los Valley Sanitary District. That study's ongoing right now, and we're trying to, we're going to fly in the face of whatever they come up with. What if they come up with the fact that, gee, San Quentin is in is in Los Angeles Sanitary District's sphere of influence and and, and and urban service area, and and they need the service? It's going to be too late if we give it away. If we give it away. So, in conclusion, I, I'm telling you, I, I, I'm not I'm not going to attend this closed session. I'm not going to facilitate the violation of the, of the Brown Act. I'm not going to facilitate the violation of state law, mm -hmm. section. Mm -hmm. 56133. It's pretty clear. Mm. I, I'm not putting myself in that position. Mm. You elected me to represent you and, and, and to try to do our best, do my best to uphold the law. And, and so I will not attend this closed session on this issue tonight. Thank you. Mr. Edgar started his comment by saying that we ignored him. I said our attorney said we No, Mr. Egger, you said we ignored you. Mr. Egger, I do not ignore you. I listen to every constituent. <coughs> Those who I talk to out there will tell you that I call, I listen, I think about it, and I discuss. Mr. Egger, I listen to everything that you say, Mr. Egger, and I read everything you write. I'm sorry, Gerald. <coughs> no, 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 no more no, comments. No, no, no. Uh, I, I, I just, just want to make my comment also. I'm just allergies. taking offense that we ignore, we don't listen. I'm sorry. As a board, we may not agree, but we talk, we do, sometimes in closed session, sometimes not. But we do. And we have not had a meeting since Mr. Baker presented that which he's claiming we ignored. So there has been no time to discuss, which we can't do outside of this forum. So I do listen to what Mr. Egger says. I listen to what everybody says. I was elected to do that. You may not agree with everything I say, that is just a true statement, and I take offense with that, so thank you. And I'd like to make the point that something that Frank said was not true. We are well aware that LAFCO is considering the spheres of influence. That has been brought to attention, our attention by our staff repeatedly, and in conjunction with our discussions about how a possible settlement will play out. 
So for Frank to act like he found something out that the staff didn't know about or this board was not aware of is an outright law. Mm -hmm. Secret, uh, secret contacts, you know, that stuff goes on all the time behind the closed doors. We don't get to you know, lie I, about what our staff I've never seen about. it writing from our staff. Well, and, and, and if our councils want to risk, if they want to, if they want to risk legal malpractice, hmm. that's fine. Let them go ahead. Because we've already hired a lawyer to look at possible legal malpractice by a previous attorney representing this district. The attorney said, you know, it's really tough to prove legal malpractice. Well, I think there's enough people out there that are so concerned about what this agency is doing that they're going to look at legal malpractice issues. That's not Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I just made, however. It's totally non-responsive to the comment I just made. Hey, no, no more public. Well, the point is left. No, no, no. Not just a minute. Into the no. I got a statement to make. Uh, this board approved a, uh, it's, it's, it's basically a Brett Richards uh, a lawsuit against uh, CMSA and uh, San Quentin and Marin County in closed session. They did it. They, for two years before I got on this board, they had closed session meetings on numerous occasions with their council. And so I've been on this board for six, eight months, whatever it is, we've had the same closed sessions. Uh, I'd just like to say that. We're not the only ones that have had just recently, the last couple of meetings now, Frank doesn't want to have closed sessions, but he's had them for years prior to this. And everything was done in closed sessions. And one of the people that made a comment a couple of months ago says, I knew nothing about this lawsuit. And frankly, none of you would have, except that, not that we're trying to hide it, except that Frank wanted it. <laughs> It's all done in closed session. For you to call it a Brett Richards oh, lawsuit is a lie. It was voted unanimously by the entire board. You're out of the board. whole board. You are too. <laughs> um, well, the attorney doesn't need to speak to I, I'd like to say something. Um, it, it's um, really sad to hear another board member call another board member a liar. That is really, to me, it's shameful. It is shameful. You know, you're voted to represent everybody, and and this split board it is is really getting to the point where it's dysfunctional. So, you know, you guys have the majority. If you want to get down and dirty here, you have the majority. So you can you can sit and listen to the cows come home, but you guys all vote the same. And, you know, Frank's trying to point out to slow it down, listen to the public. You absolutely have to listen to the public. And I don't get that. I don't get that from some of the board members here. You just want to move on, it's closed session, we'll get all our advice from the attorneys and make a decision and oh well. I hate to tell you, but this community is smart. And they are savvy and they're not going to take this land down. So you majority, you go right on. You just go right on. But it's not going to be the end of it. I'll tell you that. What, what majority, Pam? The majority. What majority? The majority vote, Michael. Have, have, most of, have most of our votes since I've been here been 5-0? The majority is... Have most of our votes been 5-0? Like, I don't... This is, you're doing it already. I'm not going to argue with you. Well, I don't make comments. I'd like to adjourn the closed session. <laughs>
do want to say that this board, if they so do want to open up something to the public, they can. It's up to the board. That's all I want to say. That's all I can say. Thank you. Uh, next item five is approval of agenda. Um, we need to pull item 11, a consideration of approving the special service agreement for construction management, because um, I think there's some more details to work out on that. So we we'll pull item 11. Does anybody want um, any other adjustments to the agenda? Yeah, uh, we have an informational item on D, and I'd like to put that on the agenda for a little, I have questions and some potential discussion. It's in the back. Okay, the human work, uh, resource management? Yes, I just have some questions. So we'll put it on the agenda after 15. Okay. okay. And then I'm going to get a resolution on the consent calendar, so I wonder if we need to, either we need a roll call vote for that, you know, or should we do a roll call vote for the entire consent calendar? I have things to pull up. Actually, the Brown Act requires all votes to be a roll call. <laughs> We've also been given advice that as long as it's recorded, each each director's name with their vote. I think that I think that probably meets the standard. I can't remember if that says roll call. It's been interpreted. Yeah. There, there can no longer be votes recorded that it was three to two or unanimous or whatever. That everybody's name's got to be listed. So I think most agencies just go through the roll call okay. process. Okay, Pam, you want to pull some items? Um, are you ready? No, you're not ready for the consent. On the consent calendar, did you? No. <coughs> you're off the agenda. You know, I know. I, I thought she, I wanted to approve the agenda. It, okay, we do that separately. Okay, item six is open for public to raise items not on the agenda. But do we need a motion and a we'll second to approve the agenda? I motion to approve the agenda. Okay. As modified. Pulling number 11. And adding B after 14. I will second that. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, thank you. Thank you for sharing with everybody. <laughs> and we just... We're now on to the items. Can I just... I don't know. What are you talking about? I just, I just wanted to thank you for having me. I mean, I feel like we've already come to know one another. <laughs> Even it's been almost three hours. But, um... Andrea Clark asked me to cover the meeting tonight because she is, I guess, about to land in Sacramento on a trip back from D.C. and removed the meeting for the last week this week. Made it impossible for her to be here. Um, I am a, a council lawyer at Downing Brand, which is a high polluting title that's meaningless. Um, I live up in the Sacramento Valley. I've been representing public agencies since I moved to Willows, this little town of 6,000 people in the Sac Valley. Um, um, almost 40 years now. Uh, a lot of clients are agricultural water agencies. Um, some of them are those you've read about recently that are getting no water for the second year in a row from the Central Valley Project, which makes my life pretty much there is even more interesting than mine. Um, I've been with Downey Brand since 2010 and um, part of a, a group of, of 13 or 14 lawyers that specialize in water and public agency work, and I'm happy to be here. Thank you for bringing this in. Mark Atlas, Esquire. Mark Atlas, Esquire. Right. <laughs> Welcome. Esquire being equally as meaningless as our council. <laughs> Thank you. Now it's item six. Open time for public hearing silence, not on the agenda. And the board can have a little discussion for this time. Anybody? Uh, <coughs> Uh, the audit raised some very interesting issues and failings. I am not persuaded by President Gaffney's claims of making positive change. I remind you of two recent meetings in which documentation before the board was clearly and admittedly deficient. The first instance was so obvious and so thoroughly wrongful and witnessed with such amazement by those of us present that you took no action. The second time, more egregiously, Mr. Gaffney acknowledged the flawed documents, dismissing the absent changes and corrections as the nothing material and important, just numbers, before voting to approve the matter on which clearly the board had flawed knowledge. This is irresponsible. 
From the months I've observed these meetings, it observes that only it appears that only directors Egger and Miggs consistently ask questions and resist improperly substantiated board actions. Yet they are passed over and often outvoted. You remaining three directors are in highly questionable legal territory and certainly not earning your $299 stipend. The audit contains recommendations for conflict of interest and Form 700 procedure. I would be extremely interested to see how you manage to devise such a metric when your own board president is so vulnerable. At the February 18th meeting, President Gaffney talked about what he disclosed in his campaign literature. However, when filing his pre- and post-election Form 700, Mr. Gaffney did not disclose his ownership for his principal role and substantial income earned from Barlow Wells, the consulting firm that has been your public persona for all the years I've known you, which is like 35. This raises the question, who oversees this board on this question and all others that have arisen? The problems I see with this district are the same problems that have led Ross Valley Sanitary astray twice before. There is lax oversight that enables a culture of arrogance, entitlement, and corruption by a majority of the board and subsequently the district management. You have some very good people working here. They work hard and they serve the public well. This board needs to live up to the promise and abilities of that deserving staff as well as the expectations and performance for which the public is charged very considerable fees. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Um, no more on item six. We'll move to item seven, standing committee report out. Chairman did not move Yeah, the finance committee reviewed the um, interim financial statements and the uh, a review of the financial performance through the third quarter. And we also took a, uh, our first look at the proposed uh, budget, operating capital budget for the year. We didn't, we didn't make any recommendations. We made a number of comments, but we didn't, uh, it, it's coming to the board tonight for its first review. What about Central Marine Sand? What happened there? Sand, it's not technically Sand. Okay. I forward Greg today um, uh, an email from Jason Dow that uh, we Bonds are sold and the money's going to the bank. Great. Okay, thank you. Um, item 8 is consent calendar. Matters listed under this item are considered routine and may be enacted by one motion. Um, and there will be no uh, separate discussion unless requested by a member of the board. So, please. Yes, I'd like to pull item C. Item B. C is in cat. C. Um, D. Um, e. And that's it. C, D, and E. I don't want to pull on this one, Mr. President. I don't want to pull on it. I just want to mention that uh, the staff report on item 8F, 8F is a good staff report. Um, there's issues that different board members have brought up in the past few years. For instance, using made in American materials for the way to work. Um, and, and talking about uh, uh, recycling and recovery in reference to recycling materials that we can use where, where, where available. And also addressing, and we're getting it mapped, uh, the BC, DC, sea level rise uh, that's going to impact our, our district here, and we know it's coming up. I just want to say the staff is going to be good. Okay, good. Um, so do we have a motion for items 8A, A, B? And motion that we accept the consent calendar <laughs> pulling C, D, and E. Well, there's F, too. Yeah, that's good. No, that's good. A, B, and F. Yeah. Uh, second. I'll second the motion. Okay, so we're voting on uh, consent calendar items A, B, and F. Uh, anybody in the public wish to comment? Seeing none, any further discussion? 
All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, item uh, 8C, accept income financial statements. Okay, just, um, it's, I'm sorry. On, because you did ask we should do roll call, if it was a resolution. Was there a, a resolution? Oh, yes. Yeah. Didn't we decide that? Uh, no resolutions. You have to. Okay. It's different, different yeah. than the. Yeah. Okay. Resolution. So item eight F, adopt resolution, updating Los Angeles standards, specifications, and drawing. That's what uh, Director Ager was talking about. That we added by America, we added the sea level, and then we added the recycle. Mm -hmm. So, 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 so first thing is that you seem to approve the resolution. With resolution number 151490. It's updating standard specifications and drawings for, for, for the work that we put up to do. Okay. So, first and second? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. First. okay, all in favor? Uh, aye. Was roll call. Roll call. Borstein? Yeah, aye. Scylla? Aye. Megs? Aye. Edgar? Aye. Yeah. Aye. Okay, thank you. Now let's go on to item uh, 8C, except for the financial statements. Okay, so um, on the first page 2 of 12, you have listed other income, but what is the other income? The top of line 2? It's a dry income, and it's uh, only going to address it. There's not a footnote. Um, other income is a combination of um, interest and uh, inspection fees. Um, when a contractor has to uh, buy the plan specs, it goes into other income. Uh, there's, there's a number of very small sources, and I believe those are also described in eight D when it reviews our income sources. Okay. All right, so let's see. <coughs> okay, so moving on to um, page four twelve. Um, I'm curious here again. Other income shows up on the top, and it does have a footnote. Um, but then it says the item is higher than the budget due to insurance payment received. Mm -hmm. So I guess for some reason, shouldn't we? Are we just throwing all this everything into this one pot? Uh, these are these are very very minor income items as you can see they're probably less than one percent of our income mm -hmm. so that's why it's other they're just very minor items and the footnote is referring to the fact that we have an insurance payment yes uh, so that's okay. just a that. okay. so if, if i may also footnotes are generally only put on there when that variance is somehow significant mm -hmm. right that i know okay but you don't always put them on there no, because um, if the variance isn't very significant, there won't be a footnote. The, the insurance payment is, is from the claim made by this district against our insurance company uh, for the loss of funds that when, when uh, the $350,000 home loan was made and it wasn't all returned. So the claim was made against our insurance company and they have uh, settled uh, for $150,000 plus some costs of about $8,000 that we had in addition to the, the cap of $150,000. So that's what that income is. Okay. Um, okay, page 5 of 12, the letter A. Um, what civil case is this about other income besides higher measure insurance? Oh, that's what you're just talking about, Frank. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, six of 12. Compare membership dues. Um, what membership dues are we paying? 
uh, North Bay Watershed Association, CASA. Isn't that once a year? Yes. This, this is, is a year to date. This is year to date. This is a year to date number. Okay. Um, CSDA. Um, we had a membership to Bay Work in there. Um, CWEA. CWEA membership dues. Um, so just professional societies and, mm -hmm. and industry organizations that were members of. Yeah, I just, I didn't know who, and I knew a couple, but I didn't know all of them. CASA is generally our most expensive one. How much a year? It's about fifteen thousand dollars. Fifteen thousand. Okay. Oh, and then page seven of twelve. I wanted to ask for that uh, board board fees because it, it's we're over budget board fees. I'm just curious, how do you create that budget? Do you look at practices from last year? Because we sometimes have emergency meetings. We have. Et cetera, et cetera. So I'm just curious, how sure. did we get up to uh, such a high mm -hmm. <laughs> um, It's developed by looking at a uh, historical meeting rate, knowing that we have committee meetings, um, assuming that there are uh, one to two regular meetings a month, that there are CMSA meetings, that two board members attend every month. I guess when we get to the draft budget. We, we have it. had more meetings than what had been anticipated. Right. Okay. So did you take into account that for the draft budget? Yes. yes. Oh, you increased it? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, great. Okay. Moving on. I should just wait and go over the budget for, for the whole draft budget on this. Um, on the spreadsheet. Are you on 18 now? I'm on 12 of 12. The spreadsheet. So the reason this is so high. $43 million. I don't think I've ever seen that before on one of these big spreadsheets here. Because we did a $30 million bond issue a few months ago. Right, and we haven't, we've got behind on our projects, right? Um, combination, yeah. But primarily it's, you're looking at the proceeds from the bond sale mm -hmm. and uh, the balance of other bonds. My question is for bonds. If we don't spend that money by a certain time, is there any kind of penalties? I thought we had to spend it by a no, certain time covered. and then you have to yeah. buy it. Uh, we, have, we have a minimum of, I think, three years and then we can always get reasonable when we actually have more than that. So there is a time limit to answer your question. It's, uh, I think it goes from three years and beyond. And where is that money being held? What's, is it Bank of Marin? No. no. Oh, well, it's spread in these different areas. The bulk, of it, is it, the bulk of it is in a, a bond trust fund with LAFE. Leif. And the, the funds that we were certain we wouldn't need within a 12-month period are invested in a portfolio through BNY Mellon, who is the trustee mm -hmm. that on the bond. That was in the draft, right? That was in the draft report. It's the draft report of when we get on the further in the agenda. There was some reference to that in the in the um, financial performance review of the quarterly. Yes, there is a section on the bonds that talks about that. Okay. <coughs> okay. So moving on the line items on page two of seven. <coughs> Quick question on our Comcast. Um, so it's like 5,000. 
Is that about average for us a month on Comcast? I just don't remember it being that high. This, the, um, these are two checks in one month. It's actually paying for two different months. And it is our internet connections for Larkspur Landing Circle and Kerner. So it's a high speed internet connection that is new in the last couple of months that replaces our old T1 lines. Okay. And I know it's it's not a large item, but do, you, do we do we bid on these things too? I mean, do we try and bid from other is there any other companies, I guess is the first question. And do we um, just curious. We are in the same position for service like that as any consumer. So your choices are limited. And are there other choices? Not for the high speed cable connection, no. Okay. And we need it there because it's isolated kind of thing. We need it for all of our communications. Oh, mm -hmm. everywhere. Okay. Yes. All right, moving on to page three of seven. Um, I have a question on the Friends of Port of Madeira Creek. Watershed, did, we were supposed to get an annual re review report on what they do with the money that we are pledged to them. Have we received that report? We did receive a recent uh, report. The report came and was uh, required to be submitted by April 20th, hence it was not able to be put into the report agenda packet. Uh, the latest update that I that staff can speak to offhand is that after approximately one year of construction delay and, and permitting a CEQA delay, the project has garnered CEQA review in the form of an IS mitigated negative declaration, and the project is slated for final design and for bid documents, I believe, the summer of this year. Okay. And is our contract every year to pay this money out? Isn't it uh, works with our past problems or a spill? Isn't this part of that? That is correct, Dr. Mace. Uh, for the reference. Consent decree, right? Uh, that's the 2012 stipulated order. We have the number in for it is R2 2012 0055. <coughs> this is the set from 2012, one of the two supplemental environmental projects, the other being the lateral ramp program. And this step is, is a contract based on milestones and performance. It's not a monthly invoice, it's not annual invoicing. It's based on milestones. So this payment is for actually getting the uh, environmental review and finalizing the permitting for the culvert step project. Okay, so we're, we're, we're not obligated. We, uh, we're obligated to pay on a milestone basis. We are. And what is a milestone? Uh, this last milestone was getting permits and getting ready for the documents. Uh, the set in its totality is installing a new culvert under the, the purview of Cary Parks, uh -huh. Cary Flood Control, as overseen by the Friends of Puerto Rico Creek Watershed. They are acting in the capacity of project manager and overall overseer to ensure that the district's set in 2012 will be completed. Okay. We have a cap on that, right? Was yeah, that's two, what I'm getting at. 240000 I can't remember the There's exact something numbers. there that tells me we're, <laughs> it, it has to come to an end. <laughs> and I'm trying to figure that out. It, have we been yeah, managing it? Have it, did it get lost in many No, it's, it, got, it, it got accrued when, it got, when we got fined with it. And so it's been sitting in a liability waiting for the bills to come through and for the work to be done. And I don't know exactly what's left, but there's not much. I mean, there's okay. still... So, Okay, so maybe on, maybe if you could bring that to the budget, to the draft budget, or it, we, we have another month or two before the budget will be finalized. Mm -hmm. Just as what what what's happening with that money? Okay, I'll have to look at how much it is. I I, I don't recall. I think it's fairly small. Two hundred forty. No, two hundred forty thousand. That 
just on five of seven, five of seven page line item on HR consultant. Is this RGS? It's not a, an added consultant. It's the same group, right? We're paying them out. I thought we were paying them. Are we just paying them out as we go through the twenty thousand, or how they, are we paying? They send them? us. Uh, bill once a month oh. for a very later time, and okay. we pay the and we pay for each month. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Even on, on the bottom of that page, five or seven, uh, I don't know if the town of Fairfax, there's four payments in the town of Fairfax. So, uh, do you have a project on, on the Shenmue Court? Are they, are they charging us to open the street? Is that what that is? That is correct, we're going to get the board reference. Those fees are for the district repair crews, uh, application for input from the town of Fairfax. <coughs> the town of Fairfax is, is much more apparent now to require any kind of dig, including on Shenmue Court, to be performed with a encroachment permit required by, paid for, approved by the town of Fairfax. Oh, good charging. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, thank you. I'm done with that one. <laughs> Yep. Okay. 8D, this is the quarterly report. Did uh, you guys go over this in the meeting? We did. Okay. Um, did you, you didn't report out on it, though. You just had a meeting yesterday? Yeah, I did report out on it. Like we went over these, these three things. We went over the uh, okay, financial statement, the financial performance, and the draft budget. Okay. Um, they already asked my following question. You didn't see anything in the quarterly. I just didn't want to. the calculation to come up with the totals. So if you see there's line one is the bond proceeds, line two is the bond costs, and the line three is one minus two. It's just telling you how we came to that calculation. Okay. And um, currently, do we have two million in reserves, is that right, now? Which reserve? We have two reserves, right? There's a million in each right now? No. no it's only a million. Right? Yeah. We, we, have, we have the capital reserve and the emergency reserve as our main reserves. The only one that contains funding is our emergency re reserve, fully funded per policy at $2 million. Where is it listed on the spreadsheet? Because I could never find it. What spreadsheet? Going back. 
Does it require a phone? Page 89, table 11. Okay. As a summary of fund balances and reserve balances. Okay. All right, so, but it, it's in the draft budget. Okay, I'm done on that. similar to the last year with a couple of notable differences. Uh, and the first page of the, of the draft budget really highlights those. We're, we're really looking at this being uh, a year that builds off the, the two prior years in terms of substantial uh, progress on restoring the financial health of the district. Uh, some of those highlights are pointed out there. I won't go through them at this point. Um, we have a fairly aggressive uh, capital program, as you know, and we're looking at steps to try and accelerate the, the uh, progress on that. We are primarily uh, funding that uh, with the revenues from the $30 million bond sale that was uh, completed earlier this fiscal year. And one of the other notable items that we're seeing a fairly large swing in, though it's not the, by any stretch the largest item in the budget, and that is the substantial uh, increase in the lateral replacement activity and that's occurring you know, largely uh, due to the Ordinance 66 adoption. And just to give you a sense of that, we've gone from you know, two to $300,000 at the most in grant funding uh, to just under a million dollars this year. Um, so we are looking at a number of avenues to continue to provide financial incentives for the lateral replacements we expect to be moving into the level of activities of anywhere from 500 to 700 lottos a year. So that's probably a two-fold increase in our past lot of replacement activity. So that's that's a really good thing, but it does have some financial challenges for the district because we did lend it uh, 
you know, budget in the long run for the for continuing those levels of grant funding. So that's something that we're trying to figure out, and that's also why we introduced the uh, loan program and the funding for that. Um, I won't go through the again the rest of the highlights. You have the staff report, and we have uh, Julie and Wendy and myself uh, and other staff to answer any questions. Um, so with that, I'll hand it back to the board. Are there any initial comments for the board members? Yeah. Well, a question I have, you know, when we talked about finances a little earlier, the county of Marin is now, is just now going to refinance some bonds. Mm -hmm. Do we have an opportunity to find, refinance our bonds? Our bonds are up to around 5%. CMSA uh, sold theirs at two, I think, 265. No, uh, so we, we only have one outstanding bond issuance at this point. Um, Hold it, did I say that correctly? Thank you. Two. <laughs> Thank you. The newer bond issuance, the one we just completed, is, is uh, I think, in the upper threes? Three and a half. Three and a half percent. Okay. 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 So that's pretty yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah. So, the unfortunately, first they're so new, Frank, they, that they're not... Uh, they're not called. They can't be called and retired at this point. Mm -hmm. um, they have some time to go. I, I, uh, Tom, do you want to comment? Yeah, they're, they're, they're protected from coal for about 10 years. Oh, really? All of them are. Oh, okay. And okay. even Central Marines were. Right. So we yeah. can't call, we can't refund them. Gotcha. Okay. For a profit. Yeah. For, for, you know, to you to just see your age or so, we can. Yeah. I also understood that our, our rating wasn't as good as CMSA's, and so that they were able to get maybe a little bit better rates. Than yeah. Yeah. We've got an A-plus rating, and CMSA, I believe, has a double A. Those are good reasons. Any other comments? Yes. Initially by board? Yes. These are kind of initial comments. And we're gonna give it to the audience. Well, I have questions. This is a draft I of okay. what's it? How many? Forty-three million? Wait. Anyway. So I don't, this is kind of a generic question, but on the staff you have on your your introduction, um, the staffing stable staffing level. So I've been asking, and I know Tom's interested. Are we actually going to do a staffing study? Uh, I mean, I know yeah. the the strategic plan will reflect on it, but I mean the actual number. Somebody comes in and watches people work. Is that the uh, budget? We're, Is there we're money expecting the budget somebody to come in and watch people work. We do expect to bring the board uh, a comprehensive plan for what the staffing mix and levels need to be. Uh, that's kind of an offshoot of strategic planning. So when we say stable staffing levels, what we've done is overall headcount. We don't, this budget doesn't reflect any changes in overall headcount, is what that would say. Well, I guess. Uh, to be really accurate, you really need to do one of those to be really clear um, because that's their expertise. So I don't know how other board members feel, but I thought we were going to include that in the budget, the work study, um, a real work study. And so anyway, we can always amend the budget or look at it's not done yet. Okay. When is our cease and dissolve? Desist order. When is it um, retired? It doesn't have a retirement date. It, it has an initial set of conditions that run through approximately 2020. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I have If anybody has any other questions, go for it. I got kind of gather my notes. So in, on page six, so this this budget, uh, uh, I see recommends a uh, an increase of uh, roughly fifty one dollars a year on the uh, on a single family home, less on the multi family residential. Yeah, these are the, the rates that were established in the, the you know, last year. Are you done? So, 
Well, I, I've got so much highlighted. Should I just try and... Go ahead. Okay, so maybe this might be one of yours, I don't know. Okay, so we're going to, we're going to get 400000 a year, correct? From the uh, V5 that's going to happen through CMSA. Is that what our district will... It's going to lower our net debt service payment. So it all goes towards the debt service. Correct. It's not money we could give back to the rate payers to lower their rates. It's, it, it lowers our, it, it, it does go to our bottom line in that uh, if you look at our all things being equal, we reduced our debt service by $400,000 a year. We would reduce our operating cost by $400,000 a year. But the district is operating under a structural deficit right now when you look at the five-year plan. So in terms of interpreting the benefits or the impacts of the savings from the bond uh, refi, mm -hmm. we, that's why we encourage the use of the five-year time horizon because that gives you a little more context for the impact of those changes. Okay. So I wasn't sure if we designate that money mm -hmm. or lower your rates. Okay. And, and looking at the rate on six, our budget will only will have excess funds at the end of the year. 16. I haven't got that far in here. But. Uh, excess funds. Are not sure. Well, I'm just, I, I know when we did the rate change, there was a lot of discussion about potentially, it looked like, we were, you know, here we are, we're not doing our capital, we're, we're very much behind on it. And one of the things we did talk to the community about was if it looked like in any possible uh, way, we can lower the rates. If our, do you remember that? Yes. So true. I want to know on this budget, was that looked at? Is that considered? Where is it? <laughs> or was it? You know? It's not discussed in here, Pam. It is part of the overall process the board uh, goes through in determining what uh, actual change you do want to send out in June. And we, that actually is a topic of conversation for this evening. So. You might want to take that as its, its own overall topic because it really, I think it's important to look at that in the, in the context of the entire budget and not as a single item. And actually, even more importantly, in the context of the five year projection, which is at the back of the budget. Okay. But we, we ought to, to be clear, we would like direction from the board, at least conversation this evening, on what your thoughts are on that topic. Because, yes, we very specifically included that. Uh, need to look at these each year, look at them in the context of the five-year rate for uh, five-year projection, and make findings for any changes you want to make to the actual uh, changes in the rates. Right, and we we discussed this at the finance committee, but that you know this is uh, after the refi of the CMSA bonds. There is you know more money than we had anticipated there would be, uh, <laughs> less money flowing out, <laughs> um, and. Uh, and so that is a consideration. Uh, uh, staff pointed out to us at the finance committee meeting that there's been a large diameter gravity soar uh, analysis that has actually increased the, what, what our known capital expenditures will be over the five year time horizon. Um, that would eat that up, that savings up. But one question that we asked, uh, it's showing up as a million dollars in savings the first year, when it was really estimated to be about, what was that? A, what happened um, that well, that, okay, so actually, <laughs> to get to, not you know to, what I'm talking about? Yeah, I okay. do, and not to digress. So real quick, so the, the final... Uh, or it looks like it the first year. Yeah, there's a there's a basically... Um, I don't know what's a good way to put this. It's kind of a little bit of a digression, but I'm going to give you guys an update to Schedule 3 <coughs> and Schedule 4, and the only purpose is to show you that uh, as of literally today, when we... Uh, verified the final details on the on the bond refi. Just this fiscal year only, there's essentially a calendar timing issue where the budget you have in front of you has about four, and, and it's just coincidence that the numbers are the same. The, the budget you have in front of you, the draft, has about four hundred thousand dollars more in savings just this upcoming fiscal year than we're actually going to see. <laughs> is that correct? Okay. Because Julie brought this to our attention just literally this afternoon. Meaning after two of the years of savings are packed into our one budget year? Is that what you're saying? Uh, it's, it's, yeah. it's, yeah. okay. So, uh, CMSA initially shared a schedule of payments showing um, 
by a September date of each year what was going to be the new debt service, comparing it to the old debt service, and showing the overall savings. When we verified with them, for our budget purposes, what number we should be putting in there, they said, just use those numbers off that schedule. Well, it turns out that that schedule, the number they showed in September was actually the interest that we've already paid this year. So September 2015 is actually this fiscal year's interest that we paid in January, or March, or whatever, March, I believe it is. Um, so that wasn't clear on the schedule that they gave us and told us to use to produce these numbers. Just today, we were able to get a revised schedule that showed it properly allocated into the right fiscal years. Because we were asking questions, it didn't make a lot of sense as to why we would see such a huge savings in year one and then have subsequent years be more close to what we expected. Mm -hmm. So um, the correction, we literally just got those numbers this afternoon. And to kind of put it in context, it, it, it's an important item, obviously, in and of itself, but it doesn't have a big impact on the overall budget. Right. Um, and if you look, just to kind of give you a comparison, if you look at your current Schedule 3, which is, uh, yeah, I'm sorry to jump around a little bit, but we have a, we have, mm -hmm. yeah, let, I want you, let, if everyone could find Schedule 3, it's at the back of your, Safety. Right, okay. Is this the new handout you're talking about? Yeah. Um, yeah. So just to show you, and all I want to do is so this issue isn't going to be confusing, because uh, it really is just a timing item getting updated information. You have a FY14, pardon me, 1516 budget. Uh, would that be, the look at the very, very bottom line, the net operations capital surplus slash deficit. In your current version, it's 19,311,000. And in the new version, it's 19,797,000. So just showing that we there is an extra, there's about $400,000 in change of additional total costs for this, this new fiscal year that aren't reflected in your current draft budget. And these tables have updated. Which is showing on line six is debt service. Also, Correct. debt service is the MSA. On the new one is 1.9, and on the old one was 1.4. Four. Yeah. So it's been updated in, in all of the schedules and tables that, the, uh, that we're working, that staff are working with. And it's a one time, it only affects this upcoming fiscal year after that. Everything you have in the five year projections is uh, correct. So I think we can. But just to clear that up. Right, so the difference between 1.9 and 2.5 is this quite, sort of the difference we were expecting to see, and we'll see that. We'll see that's lower debt service payments over the next No, year. no, that's why I emphasize it was just a coincidence, Mary, that the oh. two numbers are about 400,000. Oh. Uh, okay. What we're just explaining right now is that just this upcoming fiscal year, the draft staff report budget uh, versus what we just got from CMSA today due to the, the, the timing and the other issues, it's basically showing, we're showing about $400,000 too low. And it just happens to be the same number that is the structural savings we're going to be seeing on an ongoing year, years in the future that happens to be about $400,000 also. So I hope that is totally confusing that. That's why the budget is always and we, in the past, we've always had a special board meeting to just go through the draft budget. So, um, <laughs> All right, quick question on um, page 11. Total personal costs on the retirement, 15%. So we've gone up, I mean, what have they gone up to, and, and are we fully funded, and how is that, I mean, I don't, I can't figure out what, I'm looking at the pie chart, okay. the 15% of the retirement. It's, that was showing that the, the retirement benefits make up 15% right. of this new year's uh, total personal cost. So is that increased? 
uh, year on year. Um, yeah. It was 15% last year. Yeah, it's pretty stable right now. We did have a lot about the community, so I would honor all, but it's extra money. It's money we didn't think we were going to get or have, so that's where I'm coming from. But right. as, as, maybe, as Tom pointed out, we also have approximately going to have roughly eight to ten million in new capital program needs that we've identified. So that's part of the reason why we said look at it every year because there's always right. going to be new information. Right. So, yeah. Ideally, what would we like our reserves to be? The emergency reserves, at the bare minimum now. Uh, by by the policy, the board has set reserve targets, uh, and we're, we're we're a number of years away from achieving those. We've achieved the emergency reserve for two million dollars. Um, but I, again, I think if uh, you want to talk about adjustments to the rates, I would use I would kind of use that as a wraparound for your whole budget discussion because it's really, uh, uh, it's, it's kind of a high level item for the whole budget. So if you have any other issues or questions that we want to change on, that would be good to do those first. And then ask yourself a question about the rates in the context of the overall budget and the five-year forecast. That's just a suggestion. Okay, well, let's, uh, any comments from the public? Uh, um, I'm not going to come back to the board. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, my name is Miles O'Quire, and I'm a resident of Warksburg. Uh, and as a rate payer, uh, giving me $10 over the course of next year is, what, two cups of coffee at Ruli? It's not enough to make any significant difference to my life. And if the board is, or I should say the sanitary district, is running a uh, deficit in their operating expenses, uh, I think the $200,000 would be better spent to shore up its finances than the two cups of coffee that I could probably do away with. Any other problems? Okay, thank you. Now we'll bring it back to the board again. I'm on page 12. I'm just going to go going to look at some, some items on um, today. And, and we talked about this before, the HR services. And, and this budget retains $200,000 this coming year for HR services. Which means we'll have a half a million dollars in the HR services over over three years. Um, so we've lowered our our, our uh, legal costs and raised our HR costs. Uh, I don't know if it's a trade off or not, but um, I hope we'd be looking at, at, at either a person or, or or another solution other than, than the contract. This, well, this, this, I guess, recommends no change in HR services. Right. We're anticipating a, you know, pretty significant 
uh, amount of activity in that coming year. Um, and it's, you know, we, we maintain a pretty steady presence at the district. Um, a, a lot of work is ongoing. So the, 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 we do retain the flexibility, that's the, the benefit of having the contract with services that when we realize or determine that we don't need that level of service, we've got the ability to dial it down versus if we had a permanent in-house HR person, we, that would be a very different uh, picture. So that was kind of the reasoning behind going to contract with services. But yeah, it is, there's no kind of trigger point number. It costs us about $200,000 a year right now to have the RDL services. We're going to bid, aren't we? We got dinged on that from the state for not bidding for them. Uh, that's a somewhat different discussion. Um, but I, I don't think we, we had a, well, we can talk more about that if you guys would like. But, but there's no plan at the moment uh, to, uh, I mean, So you're gonna roll them over, is yeah, that what your plan is? Our, our plan is to bring the, 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 the board a new contract or a renewal of their contract and extension. Um, it's uh, something for people of business. But regardless of who does it, you're looking at a contract, and we assume it's about twenty five dollars a year. Okay. Okay. In light of the state audit, um, and you know, on page nineteen, the cost of living adjustments and those sort of things, and headcount, and all are discussed. And so we contemplate, I believe, um, as we go into uh, labor negotiations, that there will be some changes with those numbers. Correct. Right. So, and actually, I think it's noted that the HR work is um, going to be remain at the level that it is because of the numerous state audit recommendations. Um, so, in a way, that's created more work on that. Mm -hmm. And since the average uh, cost per employee of the district is listed at 165. Fully loaded, yeah. um, So that's not to say that that won't change, because that was the point of my first part of my comment. If it's, uh, if it's now around 165, um, I don't think that 200 seems out of bounds, given that I think we're pulling in a lot of different expertise. We have the consulting agreement that we have. Yeah. You know, we are renegotiating all salaries, all uh, uh, union and non-union employees, and maybe that could cause some HR situations that we might need them. So this is an area that uh, is important to the district. On page 14, and this will be the capital budget introduction. At the bottom, we're going to spend 4.3 million in contract with design work. That's in progress by June 2015 this year. Um, it, I asked the same question over CNSA. Is there an opportunity for our for our staffing to, to take on some of these um, projects, either design wise or, or project management wise? Mm -hmm. There's an awful, awful lot of money out to contracts. Mm -hmm. CMSA has started to have some project management management in house. We pay a lot of money for project management. Well, so the, the basically the volume of work that's being done under that four point three million dollars is way beyond the volume of work that you know, we basically have two engineers and a technician. So essentially, what they're spending their time doing with two engineers is they are managing the contracts. So they're managing teams in some cases that are five, ten people. So we've got a huge amount of horsepower. All we're doing is managing it. So if we wanted to bring that horsepower in-house, we would look at the equivalent, you know, apples to apples increase in our cost. So it's a, uh, I mean, basically our, with the short answer is Frank, our, we have enough horsepower to manage contracts that then have maybe a dozen people working on them to get the work done, but we don't have the internal horsepower to do this kind of work. And that's a really typical project delivery model, as that, you know, for public agencies. 
uh, because it's not really efficient for smaller agencies particularly. It's one thing to attempt just to help the Phillies Commission uh, restate mud, but uh, agencies our size, if you are going to go do three or four million dollars or five a five million dollar construction project and spend a million dollars on design and SDC, you just don't have an internal horsepower. So that, that's what the money's for. It's about 20 percent, it looks like. That if the capital is going to be 21 point nine million, and we're putting on 4.3 million contract design. Is that contract design and project management, or is that just contract design? That's a that's primarily contract design, and it, the main purpose of mentioning it there was to give the board a sense of the momentum that's being built up in the capital program. Because having four million dollars in design pipeline translates into, you know, say roughly plus or minus, you know, five to six times that amount of, of work coming in construction. So it was really just highlighting the fact that we are building a bit out of steam in terms of capital projects. Well, I don't think, but I think that it's going to be, it's going to, we we'll get to see whether the district can actually contract this much uh, capital. It's, it's in the range of 21 million, and then plus another uh, about three million dollars. So really, 20, 25 million uh, for capital projects this year. That's a lot of money. That's a lot. Yeah, that's a lot of projects. Right. Is there a way we would know <coughs> maybe mid mid year if we're not going to make all those um, CIP projects? And, and and then it would be too late really, because we have to know next month if we want to blow the lower the rate. It'd be too late. So it'd be the following year. Yeah, I think if you're looking at progress on the capital program as a metric for rates, we need to take a, at least a, I would suggest you need to take at least a rolling two to three year average because we're really actually, only, we're just now in our second year of the revised capital program. So when you look at the lead time for engineering and contracting and all of that, we haven't, we recognize we haven't gotten to where we want to be, uh, but that's what kind of this is emphasizing. So for example, in the large diameter condition assessment work, that has identified what is reasonably, feasibly, will be a single contract in the magnitude of about, you know, say nine to ten million dollars for construction. So, rather than having lots of small projects, which is sort of what the district was doing for a long time, we now are looking at fewer, very, you know, substantially larger projects, which is much more efficient in getting them done. So, that, that, the purpose of all that is we're making progress and. This year, is, we're not likely to hit it, but we're moving in the right direction. Right, and we had a discussion at the Finance Committee about also thinking about the perception to the State Regional Water Quality Board of are we going to say that we are going out there and doing as much of this work um, as, at as fast a rate as possible? Or are we going to say, right. well, no, we you know, got our bond money, but we're going to kind of bring it back in. And I think from the perspective of the web, well, how we you know, want to be able to support the Regional Water Quality Board, we set a goal that may, may seem ambitious and then see how it, you know, see if we can attain it. And, and just for what, so both of the next agenda items you have this evening are good examples of where we're consolidating and doing larger kinds of work so that we can, it, it takes, I mean, let me just say, it, it takes about the same amount of staff time on a quarterly basis mm -hmm. to manage a $5 million project as it does to manage a million dollar project, okay? Because you're looking at monthly invoicing, you're looking at construction management, et cetera. So if we can, if we spend X hours to manage and, and leverage a $10 million construction project, that's the kind of delivery mechanism we need, not 10 one million dollar contracts. There's no reason to bundle it that way. It's a very inefficient way for public agency to function. There's no reason we need to function in that way. We know what the work is, so you, that, that's a good example we have coming out of your agency. Any other questions? What would you like uh, tonight? Uh, you'd like us to. Uh... No, 
Yeah, it's just, it's a nice just discussion and direction. Mm -hmm. And I think it, obviously the board's you know essential question is what if anything do we want to do with uh, uh, to consider any changes to the scheduled rate adjustment. And um, I think what I would suggest is we, we could we could bring you back um, a some basic analysis of what that might look like. Uh, for example. Um, in the context of the five-year rate adjust or five-year forecast, what does it look like if you it's, you, you drop the, the rate increase by one or one and a half percent or something, uh, or equate it to half of the the uh, long-term uh, bond debt savings or something like that, just to give you some ideas. Okay. And we can test the sensitivity of the five-year forecast to those kinds of changes, and then come back with some recommendations. Um, there's no question that, uh, that this has had a tough time moving towards this new capital program delivery rate. And, and as we've talked about, that's, pretty, that's not unusual. Um, so there's a very real chance that we won't spend you know, that amount of money this year, but you want to make the rate decision with the context of the looking out two to three, four years and recognize that, okay, we're willing to make those, you know, make some trade-offs here. So there's, there's every opportunity to make to, to make the change, and that's why we built it into the rate ordinance and you can have this conversation each year. Um, we, yeah, I think partly, too, what we're up against is because this is entirely a month early, uh, we, you know, with, with the benefit of hindsight, we would have brought you some of those scenarios this evening, and we just, we just haven't had an opportunity to do that. But we have plenty of time uh, to, to bring you that. So if there are if there are topics not related to the rate change, if we could, if there are any big items we want to clarify this evening, that might help. Because then it will narrow our focus next month to just the question primarily of what we'd like to do with the subsequent rate adjustment. Well, um, we don't really know what to do with the, some of the wage problems because we don't know exactly. How much. Correct, and we're not going to know that before the debt, before the pardon, before the uh, budget's finalized, because the negotiations are going to go on. But but I'm concerned about these empty um, areas that we haven't filled these positions. And like I started on the board, like I said, I think you know it went from 19 people to 38 people. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sold on giving on a budget that I really I don't really know that we need certain people in certain areas. And, and I know we're trying to figure that all out, but I really need some kind of something to be clear on a vote for salaries and how many employees, and we don't have any data. Well, we just don't. Your, your, your basic assumption is, is that you, and that's spelled out in here, you, you know, it's, it's essentially the only changes that occur are already potentially built in, so to speak. In other words, if an employee is already on, uh, course for a you know for a step increase or what have you under the current labor agreement. So this is not an unusual situation. And when you hit the end of a labor agreement, you kind of hit the limits of predictability. So you make some reasonable assumptions. It doesn't mean you have to freeze. You just say, well, what's likely to happen? Well, we don't have any information. And the foreseeable changes to our rates, our, our labor structure. Let's keep in mind. They're, whatever they are, they're going to be incremental. That's the nature of typically of these types of topics. So they're not likely to have some dramatic impact on the overall budget. The wages and benefits and everything are within our operations budget. It makes up about $15 million. It's a big number. But that number is not going to swing 10 or 15 or 20 percent. If, if it moves at all, it's going to move very incrementally. So my point is, you can move forward on a budget discussion without having the details of, of that net change. You just have to recognize there's some uncertainty, which is why you have reserves. Well, so we have four positions that haven't been filled. Right, it has on purpose. We're not filling them because we're not sure exactly what we need them for. So we're actually striving for the very thing you guys have been talking about. Well, if we haven't used them for a year, why, why do we just keep rolling it over for another year? I mean, maybe we don't, you know, I don't know what's going on out so there. So we're, we're making incremental changes. So, for example... Well, then they shouldn't even be on the budget. We can always add them on the budget for a new position. That's kind of the way I feel about it. So if they're empty on that, you're looking at schedule... Uh, which schedule is that? Um, yeah, 865. I'm 
show the, um, these places where there's, you know, Oh, okay, so that's about the, uh, uh, that is operation only. A better table to look at if you want to talk about staffing is Schedule 8. Looks like this. Yeah, that's a complete picture. So if you look at the 15, 16, the far right column, you'll see we're staying with 38 total headcount. But there's some planned reallocation of some of the empty positions, unfilled positions, and that's on purpose. So you'll, I'll just point out the, the ones. Um, you'll see an unfilled SCADA technician position um, about two thirds of the way down. Uh, you'll see a USA locator technician, which is zero in the past years and one for this upcoming year because that is a new job classification. So we'd be filling it by using one of the unfilled full job classifications. So we've identified a need for the USA locator, but rather than add to the headcount, we're reallocating the existing headcount. So that's been our strategy for the past roughly two and a half years. So just don't make any new hires till we figure out what we need, and then fill those within our current cap of headcount and try to keep it as minimal as possible. So until I have that data that what we really need for a public agency, I just don't think it should be in the budget until we really know exactly what we need. We don't, what you're saying. So, no, no, it's not what I'm saying. Well, well you want to keep, <laughs> keep the potential to hire four more people. The, the vast, no, I do not. I'm not saying, I'm saying we are planning around a cap and head count that is the current head count, it's 38 people. Right. No one is suggesting we're adding people to be crystal clear. We have empty positions and they will remain empty until we know exactly why we need them and what we're going to so want. Okay, I understand. We want to keep it on the books. Yeah. The vast majority of the district needs are relatively well understood, but there's some changes around the edges that we've gotten. Okay. I just did it. <laughs> But we do have the money in the budget for all those positions. Yes, correct. Mm -hmm. And so last year, how much money did we not use by just by not hiring people for those approximately, do you know? Well, the, the positions that are scheduled to be empty, they're not budgeted for. Okay. That's why they're, I mean, they're scheduled okay. to be empty. So if you look at last year, if you look at budgeted versus actual mm -hmm. projected, you'll see that, I mean, that's actually explained in the staff report. We're off a bit, but it's mostly for other reasons. Okay. Um, so we aren't we aren't budgeting for positions that we don't anticipate to fill. That, that helps. Okay. So you're going to bring you to run some scenarios to that, and we need to decide on rates next meeting so because you have to mail it. Correct. Right. Okay. And, and we'll probably look at I think you know the influence of the of the uh, CMSA debt service savings. Yeah. Uh, we'll look at the influence of some sensitivity checks on the uh, capital budget expenditure levels, recognizing we we may not get 100% of what's uh, projected. And I think those I think obviously the capital budget is the big one, so we'll check that and see how it drives. The I know what I wanted to ask is, Craig, didn't you get some money for gray water study, Frank? Right. Yeah, we, we have year. it in the current budget. And so, is that what's happening? Forty million dollars in the budget. Mm -hmm. And uh, another. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not another. It's just money that we have. Okay. And outreach. We didn't spend any this year. Yeah. We budgeted two hundred fifty thousand. We spent none. So. Mm -hmm. So we have another two hundred fifty thousand. They could roll over. Or they could go to a different project. Mm -hmm. How much did outreach? Much is more important this year. On page one, on page twenty, it talks about Gaspi uh, sixty-eight, and it says we have to include in, 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 our, in our statements uh, the unfunded pension liabilities this year, or I guess it's twenty fourteen <coughs> thirteen. Is at the end of this fiscal year, it's going to have to show up in a in a in a you read report, is that what's going to happen? It will actually be recorded into our financial statements on the balance sheet. Yes. And that's going to show up 
at the year end report or what, what, what when we, we go through the audit our auditors will um, help us review our reports from CalPERS and get the actual entry into the accounting system correct and it will be reported as it'll be a balance sheet item because when Brett was here he was advising us that we were in, for public agencies we were in pretty good shape with unfunded pension liability but I've never really seen the number, so I, you know, um, uh, there's no. there is often a confusion. Um, Calpers um, rates and calculates things on two different levels. We have never had an unfunded obligation, which means the percentage that Calpers says we must contribute based on salaries paid out every year. There are agencies who for some reason are unable to meet that obligation every year and so they actually owe money on the annual contributions. We've never been in that position so we are in very good standing in that way. We have whatever portion of unfunded liability which is a future looking, it's a what if under the actuarial conditions of number of employees, their ages, their expected lifespans, etc. cetera. Um, what will you owe out here? And what, what do you have in the fund right now? CalPERS is a consolidated fund. We pool our monies with uh, hundreds of other agencies similar to ours. And um, our contribution is based on how those funds are doing. There is an unfunded liability. Some of that is actually considered normal and desirable. We never want to be funded today for something we're going to pay out 50 years from now or 30 years from now. There is a certain amount of unfunded that we should be because we should be contributing every year to just meet our needs when they come up. We, we shouldn't have something in the bank that are, is actuarially calculated as being needed 20 years from now. So there's a, it, it's, it's a whole investment or payment concept. I, well, I, I think Versus, our report was something about uh, $5 million. The Marin Zone Central Control District with about the same amount of employees, 38 to 40 employees. Mm -hmm. Unfunded pension liability and post employment uh, benefits. It bounces between 18 and 25 million, depending on what, what M. Sarah, the, the we're in the county retirement system, right. depending on what the proceeds that they're guarding with their with their investments. So, but there is an actual number you could read it right yes. in the budget. Will we have that? Are yes. unfunded? Yes, it and is? it's not 18 million. We're more in the five to seven million range. Okay. Calpers in general, I think, is in a little bit better shape than M. Sarah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other comments, or do we want to we move on? We're going to continue to look at this. Well, for we new board members, you know, I don't know if you know this, but we can amend the budget mid year. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if we knew that, but it's not set. So. We, we did it with a level of public cap. So we know that. Can you open it up to public? Okay, public? well, can we move on then? Who wants to talk? Are you? Public would like to. Is it, is it, we open to public one more time? Sure. Okay, well, we did, I thought. But, uh, okay, you can make a comment, sure. I just wanted to ask if you would be willing to open it up one more time. Because you had quite oh, a bit this, of discussion yes. uh, after public, because you lived in the middle. So I had a comment, but I was just seeing you. Well, yeah, there's okay. so many. So, my, my comment um, in regards to the HR that was discussed. Um, I think Ms. Nick has brought this up before. I, I have an HR background as well in regards to some of that stuff. And so I think a, a, a meeting or two ago you had mentioned something about you know seeing some sort of a deliverable. I know that was discussed when they came and, and interviewed for an extension and I was in part of that meeting as well. And I will say that I've, I've just recently started to skim the audit report that was published um, earlier this month. And you got a lot of dings that I noticed on the, the um, 
the, the charts towards the back of the report in regards to procedural, which to me sometimes means HR. Um, and so what I feel as a customer is that you're spending a lot of my money, but I'm not seeing a result. Um, and so I, I, I personally look at the rollover without um, any conscious deliverables and seeing what's really been produced not just talked about, because again, I, I said this um, half a year ago, is you can share a lot of information within other districts that are like you and not be spending so much money on consulting. Um, so I, I, as a, a customer, would very much like to see some of the, the, the work that's been done, because it's not in your audit, actually got doomed, um, and it's not on your website, because I don't see any access to policies and procedures that are with us. So if you, if you uh uh, you can take a look at information item B, okay. which is uh, the monthly HR activities report, and that um, has a, uh, two things. It has a uh, very, very high-level snapshot of a lot of the items they've been addressing to give an idea of the volume. And it also has their original work plan summary table, um, which is you know somewhat modified at this point because it was it was developed at the very beginning of their work. And part of what they were doing was coming in and assessing what the district's needs were initially. So they, you know, recognized they were walking into uh, you know, an organization with a huge deficit of unmet HR needs. So they've spent a lot of time just cleaning up. And I think the, uh, well, anyway, take, take, take a look at that. It does provide some, some information. Okay, and I, I think some of the stuff we talked about is you know, how much rate per hour is some of that costing you so that you, you get a breakdown of, you know, what that is on Schedule B and then how much money each one of those actually costed you? Right. Yeah. They, they bill us monthly. There's a full breakdown of their labor costs by position, and those are also in the contract that we, um, uh, you know, that we're operating under. So they, they do have a very specific rates, rate structure. And your contract is that on the website? Uh, I don't know if the RGS one is. It, it's it was it's been published several times in staff reports, uh, but I don't know if it's uh, so. Other than it being in staff reports, that, that would be my only way to say it's on there. But we can certainly provide it, and I know that it was provided to the auditors um, for this work. Okay. okay. Can we move on now to item ten? Oh, I have look at the, well, the, the agenda. Oh, good. Okay. okay, fine. So I'm on page. A62, that's under administration, and um, uh, item, item 16 talks about overtime. So we're under administration, and then there's salaries and benefits, and then there's overtime. And I didn't know managers were paid overtime. Where are you, Frank? I'm, I'm, I'm on page A62. Um, uh, let's see. There's A6. A62. And then there's A62. Um, line 16. Well, if we're, if we're looking at A6, for instance, A6 is there's a line number 14, board expenditures, and, and, and we find 82%. Uh, um, I guess it is budget. Now, I guess some of that's going to be training for board members. Uh, no. it, if board members are not elected, then there's no election in June 2016, so that is the cost to participate in the consolidated election. You have to pay the county. Right, but will they bill us in 16 or 7 or, or after July 1st? They will bill us as soon as they can after the election, mm -hmm. but we have to record it in 2016 because you record expenses when they're incurred, not when they're paid. Okay, so that's what that increase is. Mm -hmm. Yes. And as far as overtime and administration, yeah, the next week, yeah. yeah, we have three hourly employees that work in administration. So they do qualify for overtime. Oh, okay. Some okay. of them attend the board meetings to so take it, minutes. It's not Greg or Randall. Uh, or no. Okay. Or me. Mm -hmm. 
But there would probably need to be a stipend of sorts, right? From we attorney. wouldn't hire an unpaid person. No. So there would be, if we, if we had a position for whatever, that people are kind of getting away from that term, but. Right, I general, mean, I'm trying to figure out yeah. how to define it. Would it be a part time, somewhat unskilled position? I'm not sure. But yeah, we. So it would be like just that. like a per diem or something. Pay them some hourly wage, then we, then they'd be a contract employee, most likely. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you actually said that you could really use somebody like that, depending on mm -hmm. what their education background? I mean, right. You've got a master going into a master's level. Right. It could be very helpful here. I know Town of Fairfax does it, and other agencies. So I would really like staff to see if that's a potential thing. I think it okay. would be um, an idea. What other people think? Other board members? What capacity? Could be an engineer, it could be. Yeah. Is there any particular objective we're trying to meet with this? And well, I know I hear some stories that Randall's really uh, overworked for many long hours. I mean, maybe if he had an assistant. Mm -hmm. I mean, for the town of Fairfax, they had somebody writing grants, mm -hmm. that that was uh, someone who was an urban planner mm -hmm. getting a master's from Berkeley. Mm -hmm. So I'm just thinking, what other, yeah. what else can we do? Make some change and maybe we'll do less money to the public. I mean, sometimes well, we can work it's with really HR to kind of basically develop. You've done this at and Oh, yeah, yeah. So, mm -hmm. you yeah, know, great, you've done this. Yeah. Good success with it. Um, so, the short answer is yes. I mean, we, I know we've talked about it and we it just has not been able to happen, but. Um, it's finding is not really an issue. It's just it's really just a contract part-time employee. You, know, you okay. call it an intern, but you're, it's really kind of about finding the right person because um, they have to bring ideally some value to the organization. And uh, if you get lucky, find the right person. Like you mentioned, about someone who's doing work at Berkeley or something and can bring some special skill sets. Uh, that's always you know staring down this if we can find the right person. I think does he have something? I don't know. Yeah, but we, we, funding's not an issue, so it's not a budget Okay. Uh, on, on page uh, A6.7, it was just uh, under operations, and it's just on the telephone, we we're projected to spend about 25900 this year under utilities, and the proposal is 32000 That's about a, almost a 30% increase. Are we adding to some new phone systems, or? or uh, that's a pretty good job for telephone. Are we getting new cell phones or new iPads? Uh, line 81, right? Uh, I'm at line 81, yes. Sorry. I just, you know, I, I just highlight that stuff. We're, looking, we're going through the line. Yeah, the I budget. know we're, we're adding some cell phones for district crews um, because the, you know, the, the coverage is just really bad out in some parts of the service area and we need um, what we call mobile hotspots basically on the phones for uh, to allow this the CMMS, the maintenance management software. So they have tablets now that they're using more and more and to have those tablets be able to get data back and forth, they actually need to have a, a mobile hotspot. So we are looking at some cell phone upgrades for for the primarily for the field crew, so I, I think that's probably not a contributing factor. Um, the the response in Fairfax where there is no cell service, no cell service, period. Yeah, there's just places that are very difficult. Um, it's, I know that's one factor because we've had yeah. recent conversations about it. Um, that's that's only thing I can think of. Office equipment takes a big jump. We budget thirty seven, we spent projected to spend twenty four and we're budgeting forty five. Is there some big Something big with lines, some copy center, some copy machine, or something. Well, is that you also have a capital budget of a, a project for uh, the operating folks out of the uh, old Superbolt. Oh, right. right. Well, that's yeah. I mean, as far as upgrading the, yeah. the facility, yeah. yeah, we do. We have. Um, we like to look into getting a new modular out there with some lockers and showers. So that would be the that's that's a separate. I mean, that is that's actually covered elsewhere. Um, 
Yeah, I'm not, I'm, it's, it's just a miscellaneous. Yeah. There, there are a number of upgrades that are needed in computers that are aging out three to five years old. That type of technology just won't function well with CMMS and mobility. Well, is that what office equipment then? Uh, There's computer equipment computer in there, yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Do we have anything in here? We've talked about uh, uh, improving uh, the employees' area at, at large landings. Um, yeah. Yeah, portable, yeah. portable uh, restrooms or showers. Or, uh, it's part of the capital budget. Yeah, we we time have time. some things set aside in the capital budget, so if we can work work it out with Larkspur and get the necessary permitting, we could do some improvements out there, yes. Are we sure? It's on schedule nine. Yeah. Yeah. Schedule nine has a line item. Yeah. 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 Oh, Larkspur landing, there we go. Longer shower facility is up there. Is yep. I see that. Okay. Yeah. So our biggest hurdle there is just to try to work out the permitting with the last If we were going to put in a, you know, a trailer, rent a trailer, I mean. That's, that's kind of, we're just looking at a, a modular. Modular. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. When I say a trailer, a physical one, they would tow in and take yeah. out from time to time and clean up and bring back. I, don't I, know. I think we would still need some permitting or water permissions water from water Larkspur. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So one more quick thing. Um, Sandy, you mentioned that there's a in our strategic plan, we talked about the business becoming green. For us to have an assessment evaluation, it is going to take some money and make some changes. Do you think, Rick? Like lighting and all that. Uh, within the buildings and what yeah, that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, you can, we can definitely, you can have people come in and do energy audits. Um, look at things like you know changing that lighting, what have you. That's pretty minor for us, but we're also you know we're looking at trying to use the recycled water for the state program and so forth. So if there's many any opportunities, we'll take a look. Do we need money for the budget to? Uh, those would be yeah. small enough that we would just. You're okay. okay. Yeah. Great. Okay, so we can bring, we'll bring you guys back some scenarios on the rates uh, for the for the uh, main meeting. And um, if you, I mean, it is a draft. If you see if anything else, you know, feel free to I mean, certainly ask questions or reach out to myself or Wendy or Julie, and we can okay. make any additional updates. I think again, the biggest item we know is capital projects, and that's the one we we're going to take a look at. Okay, let's move on to item 10. Consideration of approval of uh, professional service order. Uh -huh. Where it's after 10 o'clock, and we're supposed what? to review the... Um, well, we have to do this, so... Well, we still need to do what uh, those bills are... Rosa Group's going to review what items can we put off for the next one. 11 came off. 11's off, and we got 10 and 12 are coming up here. Let's go to 10. Uh, consideration of approving professional services agreements, engineering, design, engineering services during construction of pump stations 12 and 13 uh, pump station rehabilitation products with waterworks engineers at the city of Not to exceed $814,751 in authorization for the general record to execute the agreement. Okay, so uh, you have the staff part in front of you for item 10. So uh, this is a, you're considering uh, awarding the, a design contract where we've consolidated two of our most critical pump station projects. And as is explained in the staff report, the pump stations have been noted to be a major area of, of critical upgrade need since really going all the way back to the 2007-2008 uh, sanitary sewer master plan that was done back then. Um, there's been a few, you know, small upgrades here and there, but nothing too significant. So that these needs have only grown. So when we did the 2013 infrastructure asset management plan, we had a multidisciplinary team go through the pump stations, looking at structural, electrical, uh, pump capacity reliability, uh, bypass pumping, versus bypass pumping abilities, and the uh, there's a just a long list of really critical upgrades to the pump stations. What we've done is pick the two highest priority, which is pump station 12 and pump station 13, 
and package those into a single design project because we want them to be very similar in terms of design features and they're also of equal, roughly equal critical need. Um, so we went through a fairly traditional qualifications-based selection process, got a very excellent response uh, on the proposals and went through uh, three levels of review. We had an initial staff review to pull out some of the really obvious uh, <coughs> qualified firms. We then had a series, uh, a panel of independent experts, uh, including uh, senior staff from uh, Sacramento Sanitation, and I think the other agency is listed. Um, they helped us whittle it down to four firms. And then we interviewed those, all four firms uh, showed up and brought their teams in for in-person interviews. And that was with a panel that included myself, uh, Dave Bernardi, the retired uh, former public works uh, for the city of uh, Santa Fe. And I don't know if folks know Dave, but he does a lot of uh, independent contract uh, work now for construction oversight and capital projects administration. Uh, and assistant engineer, uh, Catherine Hayden, who's, who's not here this evening. And so that was the process we went through. We, based on qualifications, we, we ended up ranking Waterworks engineers number one, and then we went through the cost information and uh, determined them to be very, very competitive on the cost front. Uh, we then negotiated the contract, and that's what you have in front of you. If the contract's approved, we're gonna move right away into kicking off design, like literally tomorrow, on uh, both pump stations. And the idea is to conduct a single design effort, and then we can figure out during design whether we want to issue a single construction project for both pump stations, or we want to do two separate construction projects. So that's to be determined down the road. All you're doing this evening is considering the design uh, an SDC, is it, is it yes. extent, like yes. design an SDC contract mm -hmm. uh, for the pump stations. Uh, the money is in the budget, and these are just very high priority pump stations. It's pretty exciting to get going on it because we're looking at a real kind of overdue modernization and update to these pump stations. They're really stuck basically with almost 30 year old technology at this point, uh, undersized and really, really in need of uh, some, some pretty significant overhaul. Basically, if it's not made of concrete at either of those pump stations, it's going to be gone. It's metal, it's electrical, it's mechanical, it's going away and getting upgraded. So they're going to be kind of really ready for the next 20 years and really modernized. So that's what you got in front of you. We have uh, representatives from the design uh, firm here this evening, and we have Randall Ishi, a district engineer, and myself answering questions. So, okay. board members, any comments? So when, when, I, when I went through the, the proposals, there's kind of dollar that they say check the envelope because you our bids in the envelope. Right, we did it on purpose, Frank. That's that's the sealed envelope approach where we okay. just we get we have to give a qualification proposal, separate sealed cost envelope, so that we just evaluate them on qualifications initially and then we look at the cost. So so I, I went through these thinking I was gonna find a dollar amount. There's no dollar amount. Um, and it probably would be good for the board to actually see a spreadsheet with bidders and how much they we how we arrived at those costs. You know, uh, you know, yeah. we, we don't seem to get that information. Um, yeah. I actually, I went through these and I, I kept looking for the bids and there were no bids. Do you want to, oh, is it just the one now? Sorry about that. Okay. Well, so this is, uh, well, so first of all, we can start doing that. I, uh, we, we know that's been a question in the past. Um, this will show you, and I'll just hand it down to the board. It's the top four firms that were interviewed and their, their overall costs. Um, by the time we were done with the four interviews, actually one of those firms had been determined that we really wouldn't, we didn't feel that they were qualified, let me put it that way. That's why you only have three bids in here. Yeah, so that, that table shows you the cost proposals for, for four proposals, and I just want to point out one of them, we, after the interviews, we really determined they, uh, regardless of cost, we probably wouldn't want it. Oh, that was West Yost. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. <laughs> at seven at seven seventy six. It's interesting. They've yeah. done work for us before. Yeah, yeah. No, and it's you know it's not a slight. I mean you know they're a big company. Everyone brings different teams. Um, we it was just very unanimous with the interview panel that they 
didn't demonstrate a real high quality understanding of the project. So that's you know how it goes. So Waterworks Engineer, where are they from? Uh, they're based actually, well, they have offices in Oakland and in Reading and in uh, Phoenix and where else? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm Sammy Gator with Waterworks Engineers. Um, so we have offices, like you said, in, in um, Phoenix, yeah. it's actually Scottsdale, in Salt Lake City, and then in California, we have an office in Los Angeles, um, in um, San Mateo, in Roseville, and in where are you from Oakland, from? and in Reading. I'm from the Oakland office. And I'm from the Reading office. I'm the principal in charge of the, of the project. And you're going to be the project the, manager. The project manager out of Oakland. Yeah. Okay. How do, we, how do we get from 807 to 814? And, and I don't know. Uh, just minor, uh, I think primarily we, we recognize we might want to be doing some just initial upfront hydraulic analysis. Yes, correct. Hydraulic yeah, hydraulic yeah, hydraulic 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 hydraulic. Hydraulic. And this project starts when? Uh, <laughs> 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 I mean, it would, the board approves it. 1030 tonight. What kind of surprised me when I was going through is looking at the real reliabilities um, statements. Mm -hmm. Kind of scary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's no bypass, pumping capability. No, they're, they're in dire uh, I'm very... just surprised they haven't been in place till now. But anyway, it's a good thing. Yeah. So I'm supporting it. Thank you for patient wait. Yeah. What's the usual life of a pump station like this? Isn't it something like 20 years or? You usually look at it in components, so the structural components, uh, you know, the concrete and, and steel components, you know, maybe 50 years for concrete components and maybe 30 years for pipes and, and 15 to 20 years for large pumps and 10 to 15 years for smaller pumps. There's sort of a range when you do a, if you look at the different assets in the station. Well, I think these pumps were from the 80s, weren't they? Correct. Yeah, and they've also been operating for a long period of time at, uh, until recent, until the last couple of years, they've been operating at, at very inefficient operational settings. So they've been operating uh, in very strenuous cycles and in very inefficient manners. Yeah. So the mechanical electrical equipment is just really beyond its, its you know, intended life. Any more comments from the board? I mean, I, we, uh, when we first got on the board, we took a tour of the pump stations, and uh, they looked pretty really old to me. They haven't gotten any better. <laughs> <laughs> and these are priority one <coughs> station projects. Yeah, these are the highest priorities for the district right now, uh, by, a, by a pretty clear shot. Okay. Uh, I was reading about the really 14, but was that in this packet, or was it another packet? I might have read that in... Uh, it's on the list, Frank, for overall improvements, but it's, it's not the high priority. So it, it, you may have seen it in other, um, like in the, I think we have some excerpts from the IND in here, so you might have seen it. I'm going to it in Yeah. They all need varying levels, for sure. This one, these are the two that are the highest. And, and the flow meters, did, um, did, are we getting new flow meters? Or are we uh, well, the that's, we just bought? We, uh, so that's actually going to help in this design effort is we, uh, we now have operational high quality flow meters in pump station 15, pump station 13, and pump station 14. 12, we purposely didn't do it because it's hard to get to in terms of installation, and this project is going to end up tearing out a lot of that. So we have a good chunk, and pump station 10 already has one as well. So we're getting there. We're a lot closer than we were a year ago as far as having flow meters. Yeah. Uh, when this project's done, uh, 10, 12, 13, 14, and 15, all, all five majors will have flow meters when this station is done, so this project is done. Good. And so we see that the bids initially ranged, at least from the three that you selected, ranged from 807,000, then there was a bid at 863,000, and then another bid at a million two, one five. It's expensive. Yeah, yeah. But you're the low of the low cost of the final three. Mm -hmm. so Can I make a motion? Yeah. Are we ready to call the vote? <laughs> okay. Um,
Um, <clears throat> so, I move to approve professional services agreement for engineering design and engineering services during construction with PS12 on air and PS13 Green Bay Pump Station Rehabilitation Project with Water Projects with Waterworks Engineers LLC in the amount not to exceed $814,751. And authorization for the general manager to execute the agreement. Second. Okay, is there any comment from the public? <laughs> any comment from the board? Just a quick, quick question, not holding anything up. Uh, do they do both stations simultaneously? And what is the duration of the whole project? So that, the question about whether both stations will be upgraded simultaneously is part of what we're going to be examining our scope of work in the coordination of those two station improvements and what is most advantageous to the district and the public. Um, uh, the overall time frame right now, there is a schedule in our contract. Yeah. I don't want to miss uh, yeah. speak so I'm picking it up. Okay. Don't worry about it. Okay. If just the footbridge, for footbridge can remain about the same size-wise? Yeah, the intent right now is to work within the footprint of the existing stations. Um, as we go into the analysis, if there's reasons to go outside that, we'll you know, bring those to the staff and discuss them, but at this point, the intent is to the existing structures. Are we going to impact any of the neighbors at all that any of this work? No. Yeah, we're, we're acutely aware of the need to minimize impacts to the neighbors and the public and the, the, the shopping public in that whole area. Okay. Uh, so, a call for the question. Uh, uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? No, okay. Thank you very much. We appreciate the opportunity to work for the district. Thank you. Have you done work for us before? No. We are no. uh, currently doing a little bit of work for you at uh, Prop Station 15 on some of the electrical issues there, but uh, we do appreciate the opportunity. Will there kick off this tomorrow morning? Yes. Kick off this tomorrow morning? Yeah, it's tomorrow at uh, 11. Okay. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. Let's move to item 12. Consideration of the contract amendment number one by Harrison Associates in the amount of $1,454,966 for engineering design and engineering services for reconstruction of the fiscal year 2015-16 gravity sewer improvement project. So the the, this really goes to the heart of the conversation we've been having about the efforts to uh, improve the efficiency and the capacity of our project delivery uh, program. And so when we, we just recently, as the board will recall, we just recently left the construction contract for what's called the FY14-15. That was our first five miles of gravity sewer rehab done under the new project delivery and evaluation model. Um, that Con the construction contract was just awarded. So prior to that, we had awarded a competitive, through a competitive RFP process, we had a, we did the design of that work with Harrison Associates. Um, the work was, uh, went very well, everything was done uh, on schedule and, and very good quality. And when we, when we did the, the RFP for that work, we, we purposely mentioned uh, the opportunity that, or at least the possibility that if the work went well and at some future point the district uh, wanted to consider it, we could extend those design services to take on the next five miles so that we could maintain some momentum uh, in the design and construction cycle. Because if you, if you think of our five mile a year target that's going on for like the next five to six years, you've got you know, design, construction, et cetera, you've got these phases that are that have to continue in, in basically a, essentially a never-ending cycle. And we're trying to essentially get caught up on that cycle so we can meet the five mile per year target that's in the cease and desist order. So this amendment is basically supporting that objective. Um, what, what you have in front of you is a contract amendment to have Harris go ahead and take care of the next batch of gravity sewer rehab work. Because we've run everything through the risk model, we already have the work batched in terms of identifying where the work needs to be done. We've consolidated a lot of it. So instead of five miles, we've got roughly, I think, uh, is it eight to 10 uh, miles? 
there about eight. eight so we've got approximately eight to ten miles. It's got some of the high priority capacity uh, segments in there. And the basic idea is to uh, keep the momentum, get this design work done in a very aggressive way. This is about a six month design window and be able to put this work on the street in the essentially in the spring of calendar year 2016. So roughly say February, January, February of this upcoming year, we're letting a contract for construction for approximately eight to 10 miles of gravity sewer rehab. Um, the single biggest concern that we anticipated, and I think as the recent um, you know, discussions have highlighted, is how we verify that we're getting a good you know, cost competitive uh, rate. So we, we looked at this several different ways in conjunction with Harris in terms of evaluating it uh, in terms of percentage of construction and what have you. And essentially what it boils down to is this. We retained Harris's services through a competitive RFP last time. They were a very strong contender. They've done the work efficiently, on schedule, on budget, and they're going to commit. Their, in this con contract amendment, we're getting essentially the same unit cost of design going forward for this this next chunk of work. So that you know that and the proven track record of the work they just finished is essentially what we're saying is a good basis for making the amendment and moving forward with this work. It's cutting, you know, several months at a minimum off the process. Uh, just keeping a good quality team moving. Uh, they already know our in-house review uh, construction uh, selection method uh, methodology. Um, so that's really the, the, the basis for the staff recommendation. And we have um, uh, representatives from Harris and uh, District Engineer Randall Ishii and myself to answer any questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, well, so, go ahead, Frank. I, I, I got an email from someone I don't know. I don't know if they get any more than an email from somebody. Oh, okay. yeah. Yeah, I, I printed it out. I don't have, I don't have that um, name on it. I don't know that. who that person is. But. We, I did get the same. Well, Michael forwarded me the, the email. So let me, let me address, because I am familiar with the email, um, uh, Frank, and we can speak to it pretty directly. Um, so the person who sent the email is, a, you know, expressing concerns about the costs of the design as a percentage of construction and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, we looked through their information in detail and evaluated their, their, their facts and understanding of the project. And, and essentially, I, all I can say for the board's consideration is I don't think the person had their information correct. And the percentages and the data that they cite are probably 20 years out of date uh, for the industry at this point in terms of construction percentages uh, uh, for design. So we, uh, but because it's a very important contract and recognizing those are pretty legitimate concerns, um, I had um, Bern Phillips and Randall and I uh, uh, kind of communicated late yesterday and they've spent a good chunk of today scouring through all the recent construction and design projects and, and putting together data to substantiate um, our conclusion that the information communicated in an email just isn't accurate. I don't, I mean, that's really what it boils down to. The numbers are incorrect. The percentages uh, that are presented in the email as industry averages don't stand up. Um, do you guys want to provide a summary of that? Uh, or Randall? <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I mean, we basically looked at what the district anticipates doing, not knowing exactly what the uh, construction method is going to be, but based on our past experience in designing, um, not only this last year, 14, 15, but also the Group B work that we did before that, we've got a good idea of what it costs to not only do our design, but what the construction costs are going to be ultimately when we finish the design. And based on the footages that the district plans on doing for the next uh, program, this is a significant increase in footage, not only uh, for the CIPP, the pipe bursting and open cut work that we have been doing, but we may be getting in some new technology as well with microtelling or um, Arbor, uh, where we have some new alignment that we're going to want to do uh, 
preciously. So there's a higher level of engineering involved, not only with just the footages that are increased, that are actually uh, more than double than the five miles actually that we designed uh, under the 1415 work. So the, I got actually in footages that we count um, and the construction value in terms of costs per mile, if you want to look at that based on what we've been getting for construction costs. The costs per mile are about uh, 1.4 million to do the work that we've been doing based on these la the last year's program. And the design is had, based on our design from last year was about $141,000 per mile. And if you equate that with this next year's program, and again, we don't know what the mix is gonna be with, with open cut or pipe bursting, which requires more engineering work. The, the, the drawings require plan and profile, uh, and we do utility locating, we do surveying, and we do more potholing, as opposed to CIPP lining, which we'd like to do more of if we can, where we don't have those kinds of costs um, and the engineering costs are lower. But in this next program, we're estimating um, we're, we're going to have uh, the 10 miles of um, sewers to be rehabilitated, and the larger percentage of that is going to be on pipe bursting and open cut work, which is going to require more engineering. But if you take those same numbers um, that I just gave you as far as on a cost per mile basis, we're at our engineering uh, fee estimate. And uh, this year's estimate includes services during construction. Last year's uh, work, we uh, had just the estimate for design. Later, we uh, added the services during construction as well. So the, the numbers are, are, are pretty consistent with what we've done in the past. And those percentages, based on the footages, are a percentage of, uh, if you want to, to look at the engineering fee in terms of uh, percentages of construction, we're, we're in that same uh, ballpark of 10 to 15% of uh, the engineering fee. We're on the higher end of that because we're looking at not only um, some more sophisticated uh, construction techniques if we get into for the, the, the Butterfield uh, work. In, it is about a mile of construction that may be more technical because we're actually rerouting sewers and we may want to do this trenchlessly with um, auger boring or, or microtunneling. But also, we are delivering twice as much footage, uh, actually a little bit more than twice, in the same time period. So our crews have got to mobilize and do uh, twice as much work as we did last year. And we've already uh, geared up to, to, to do this actually for, for the program. These deadlines are, are very important to us. We, um, we hit the, the targets the last two years with meeting the, cease and desist, the cease and desist order from the regional board. To do that, our guys, and I was there, were working around the clock those last hours to get the bid out and to get um, the uh, time uh, met uh, for the, for the uh, cease and desist. This year, we're having to pull in more, more folks to do the twice as much footage, basically, in the same six month time frame. So, I think the, the, the costs are consistent. Um, our, our track record speaks for itself. Um, we really appreciate the work that we do, do for the district, but even more than that, we go to the mat with the contractor when we had um, uh, these change orders that were, we felt, unreasonable. And um, we basically, um, in, in the interest of the district and their ratepayers, um, face down the contractor basically on some pretty good change orders um, that in the end we were able to really uh, save um, a, a little over $300,000 for, for the district on those change orders. So all I'm saying is um, our staff 
knows the district uh, procedures, policies, the um, condition of the sewers that you have in the various areas that we need to work in. We know the utility uh, agencies and the city staff with your partner cities that we need to be dealing with. These are all going to be helpful to deliver this double the amount of, of uh, construction in the same period of time as we had uh, to do last year. So um, I just feel that given these constraints um, that the, these estimates, the, the, the fee estimate is um, it's a not to exceed number. Um, if we don't use, use the money, it goes back to the district or we roll it into um, other services that might be needed later. So um, we, we don't want to disrupt the relationship that we have with, with uh, the city staff or, or yourselves uh, in, uh, in that regard. So. Okay. Thank you. I have a question. Uh, how did their bid come, when you did the RFP process, how did Harris's cost estimate compared to the others that you uh, they were, they were uh, quite competitive. Um, I think Randall has oh, the, right. the original results, yeah. Um, I know you sent those together in front of the well, I again read the packets and I saw no numbers. Uh. Yeah, that's... that's What were your total costs on the, the last project? Can you remember? Yes, um, 538,000. So in the original proposals, and this is again, this was when we were just starting work on that 514.15, uh, we had we had quotes ranging, you know, from uh, a little under 400 to as high as uh, a little over 700, and Harris and Associates was at 538,000 and change. Um, the person whose firm provided that email to you was at $688,000 and change. Um, so again, their, their, their email is a little out of whack with their own history because they gave us a proposal that had uh, design as a percentage of construction, that was significantly higher than the figures we're citing in the email. So I, I, that's just some inconsistencies. But the, the bottom line is, um, when we went through this effort last time, uh, out of one, two, three, four, five, six proposals, we had one, two, three that were substantially higher than Harris, one that was lower, and uh, uh, two, two of that were slightly lower, three that were substantially higher. Mm -hmm. So kind of right, I'd say in the lower middle. Okay. But was there a reason we didn't take the lower bid of, of those contracts? Yeah, this same, this was again, this was a qualifications based, and after we went through qualifications and we looked at costs and we decided, and then we negotiated the contract. So because these are called, these are professional service um, contracts, we aren't. Uh, you know, going with the lowest, they're, they're not really bids, uh, so we don't always pick the lowest cost. I mean, if they're the highest qualified and they're the lowest cost, that's a great combination, but it doesn't happen very often. So, um, yeah. So the state auditors did buy that from us. Uh, well, actually, the one, the one item that the state auditors gave us an unequivocal positive comment on was the quality of our, if you exclude the emergency contracting, they they went through all of our last couple of years of capital project contracting process, and they really gave us a un, sort of unqualified positive comments on, on how we're awarding our capital project. So you guys, I mean, the process we're going through actually was seen as very good by the, by the state auditor. Well, I, well, what stands out is the one where we gave Major Gelati another $4 million right. contract right. based was, on their yeah. previous work, yeah. and the state said, yeah. You know, you could have put it out for bid and got a. You might have got a better bid. Yeah. Uh, what are you doing here? Yeah, so that was the emergency emergency contract. Uh, yeah, which they did find fault with, as you know. Yeah, yeah. So. Hmm. Uh, well, I might just put this out to bid. Would there have been a problem doing that? Well, uh, uh, it looks it looks like you're gearing up to give Harris Associates the, the next five years of contracts under that theory of they did a great job and 
No, this is built. this is a very specific one year amendment. Uh, after you know, at some point, I would definitely suggest that the board consider doing larger, more consolidated contracts. After this one, uh, those would definitely be out for competitive proposals. Though. Larger than ten, than ten miles. Uh, I don't know that we'd ever get larger than that, Frank. And the only reason is we, we only have so much um, uh, system assessment and risk modeling done, and, and so you get to a practical limit. But this is, again, you know, this goes on for three or four or five years at this point, and you've really taken care of the, a lot of the more, most critical areas of the district. But, but to be clear, this is, this is a, a one-time amendment for this work so that we can build the momentum on the capital projects and then uh, what you're probably seeing in the future is similar scale of projects, but we'd be going out again for competitive proposals. There's, there's no intent to, to roll this over or do anything further with it. So when this email says it's talking about a non-complete contract, what do you mean not? What's this person? Uh, you have to ask them. I don't okay. consider, we don't consider it a non-compete. We consider it an amendment to a contract that was issued under, under uh, very standard <coughs> professional services competitively uh, under a competitive RFP process. Yes, yes. So I have a question for council. Um, is, is this potential set up for a lawsuit by these other agencies who want the job? And because, I mean, I don't think I've ever seen an amendment here. And if somebody comes along and says, oh, well, I just got $500,000 job, let's say another contract service, and then they go, well, you gave Harris and Associates a $1.4 million job because you amended it. Well, you can do the same for me. And if you don't, I'll sue you. Is that potentially an item here? Um. <laughs> The reason I'm smiling is that I call clients all the time. The, the question isn't, it, well, it's easy to file a lawsuit because all it takes is a few hundred dollars and you know, drafting a complaint. The question really is whether or not the person that sues you can win. Um, expensive construction company can win. Well, I understand that. Um, but, but sort of in response to Frank's question too, I get asked a lot by public agencies about consulting contracts versus <coughs> construction contract vision. And, and the difference really is um, that there's so much subjectivity to the services that you're, that you're seeking from design consultants and people like that, even lawyers for that matter, um, that's why the law allows for more flexibility in a public agency to pick consultants that they can work with. Uh, the legislature is giving you the authority to do that. Back to your question. I think then that the answer to the question is, you know, can you get sued? Yes. Is the person going to win? No. Because you have the discretion to pick consultants without, the, the legislature has essentially decided that consultants are not peas in a pod and you have a right to pick the one that you're going to work with. And whether that's an initial contract or a subsequent or an amendment to an existing contract, really there's no, okay. no distinction. Thank you. When I read this. That was clear. Okay. I have another thing what? I want to bring up, if that's OK. Um, I noticed the thing we just voted on to have this peer, peer review. Mm -hmm. Do we do a peer review of the situation? It's a lot of money. Uh, in the prior RFP, uh, we had assistance. I, mean, I think that's a, such a great opportunity yeah. for us to, you know, bring in that extra set Yeah, and we, and we did that on the pump stations. Uh, this one, I mean, we're, we're partly working on the idea, you know, we're, we're, we're essentially coming off of a, a team that's done a really good job, and we're, they're saying they're going to commit to the same uh, you know, basic cost of, you know, unit cost of the work. So the short answer to your question in Pamela is no, we did not. Do you think we should? Uh, I, I don't. I, I, my, my recommendation as general manager, obviously, is to, is to, is to do one, a one-time amendment to this contract. It's, it's providing a really specific objective for the district to kind of get us caught up on the capital program. But yeah. I, I, beyond that, we're coming back in the future with a whole new competitive proposal process for the board. Uh, beyond this one, yeah. When I read this, 
the other day. It says right on page one of the discussion that on June 18, 2014, when they approved the original Harris contract, it included the following. The district seeks this work for this fiscal year. The district also seeks an efficient, stable, and repeatable process for, deliver for project delivery of its annual mileage of gravity sewer rehabilitation work. Thus, there is the option that the district may amend this contract to seek additional design, design services for up to one more annual cycle of the design services. So that this isn't like, oh, two months ago, we just decided, oh, what the hell, let's go for it. This was thought about last year, that if you really deliver an amazing amount of work within budget, within time, that we will, at our discretion, seek exercise this option, which is, I think, what we're doing. Right, and I, that's I, what you're, that's kind of what you're, what we're operating under. I mean, that was the idea, and now that we have the last project behind us, we see the track record, that, that, that's essentially the, the idea. You, you know, the, the situation is though that it's such a large amount, you know, it, it, it's, it's worrisome. I mean, uh, it's more than double their first contract. Or mm -hmm. almost speaking. What would happen if we don't approve it? We lose. Uh, we we would well as soon as we we would go back out. We would come back in several months. Uh, with a with whatever the results are of a, of a new, uh, we, we lose two to three months as well. Uh, yes, and it, yes. Is there a way to break it down into smaller dollar figure for a limited scope of work? Well, I, yeah, I guess I'm not. So I mean, I know the numbers. Uh, not that, I mean, it's all relative. Um, the, the work is very, very similar. It's, it's identical type of work. Um, well, anyway, I don't know if I'm answering the question. The, the, the short answer is if we don't, then our options are to, um, uh, you know, basically go back out through the, the standard process, which is what we would be doing in the future eventually for the next go round. And uh, arrive back at the same point, maybe in you know three months or so. Mm -hmm. um, we would definitely not be looking at starting construction in the spring. Uh, we would be just because of the, the time. Uh, that's that's just an observation. So. And then we did talk about that we wanted. The reason you did 10 miles is because you want to catch up with your capital program. Correct. And, it, and we already have all the work identified because through the risk modeling and commission assessment. So this is just basically batching it up and putting it in the lint package so it can get done. Any comments from the audience? Yeah. And, uh, What's the pleasure of the board? Oh, yeah. The contract last year, uh, Harris uh, was the number three bidder at five hundred thirty-eight thousand six eighty-one. West Yost was a low bidder at three hundred seventy-six thousand five seventy-one. Blair, just like Blair, Hooch and Flynn were. Four hundred forty-seven thousand. So, so last year when the contract was granted, Harris was one hundred and sixty thousand dollars over the little bit. Yeah, you know, I, I don't have the minutes before me. I don't know if I voted for this or not last year, but I've been trying to to, to vote for the low bid on these contracts, and I, I'd almost like to look at look at the vote that I cast on this on this project last year to see. I'm trying to be consistent, and so you know, for one point four million dollars. If you read that state audit, I, I, I think you take this audit seriously. You put that out to bid. That's just my, that's just my, you know, top of the head thinking. Not trying to get into they did a great job for us, and so you know that they had a five hundred thirty-eight thousand dollar project. They did a great job. I mean, to get them this four point four million dollar project because they're going to do a, continue to do a great job. Um, you know, maybe they would have bid it at one one point one million. I have no idea, but but 
Well, that's the, just to be clear, everyone. We it is not. This is a professional services contract. If we go out for RFP, we don't necessarily take the low bid. We take the highest qualified firm, and then we negotiate a price with them. If we don't agree on the price, then we go to the next highest qualified firm and negotiate a price. That's how QBS selection works. So we are not doing low bid contracting for professional services. We're following the state code, which again, this was something that got it. They very clearly we were doing a good job on terms of how we wore our professional services contract. So I just want to be clear, because I know there's repeated references to low bid. We don't select professional services based on low bid, typically. You know, that's great for management. We're the elected representatives of the people out there, and we're going to explain to them, well, we're not taking a low bid because we don't trust it, or we, somebody else can, uh, you know, I, I mean, I, <clears throat> I used to go round and round with Jolie Houston, you, 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 the person who sat there before you, you know, right. over the low bid stuff. You know, we put a con, we put these RF requests for proposals out, in come the bids. I mean, there's one year, uh, 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 Caldwell was like, they were the high one, and I was objecting to give it. The board gave the contract to them, but they were like, like the high bid. And, 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 and it's, it's hard for me to rationalize in my mind that we're spending the public's money and, 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 and we're, we're approving a high, the high bid or the middle bid, I mean. You know, if, the low bid, if the low bid could do the job, why not take the low bid? I don't know. Can I clarify, uh, Director Eggers? Sure, Just sure. In general, um, we're, we're acting under two different statutes, uh, legislations, professional services. We're told that by our lawyers all the time. Oh, good, good. The lawyers can run for this job and they can, they can represent the people and that's how I feel about it. But I mean, legally, <laughs> following the Brooks Act, uh, professional services are selected based on the best qualified, and then you you negotiate the con uh, the uh, construction fee or the or the uh, the fee estimate, as opposed to the public contracting code, which requires contractors to be selected as at the low bid if they're responsive and responsible uh, contractors. So, two different legislations here, uh, just because. It is professional services, and you want to have the best qualified uh, uh, firm designing or being your uh, partner on this important work. Uh, so there are two different. Uh, uh, well, bottom line, it's a no good contract. I don't know what else to say. The scope of the services from last year's June contract that was awarded in this one are not the same. It's, I mean, it's. It's not the same mileage. It's, right. I mean, this project going into the next one is a bigger chunk mm -hmm. of, of the pie, isn't it? And yeah, the footages are basically m more than double, actually. So more than double. Than double. Yeah. You would expect the cost to go up to the Well, the cost per, the, roughly the cost per mile is uh, how we wanted. That's why we use the term unit cost. Yeah. So just that's what we're saying is the same. Yeah, the volume of work is going up, so the total dollar value of the, the design terms is going up, but the, the, the rate of cost or the unit cost is, that's what we're saying is staying consistent. Consistent. Yeah. You know, I, I was kind of surprised at the New dollar amount of this. But I'm very uncomfortable with no RFP process. I don't. I understand that we can award, you know, to the best qualified and pay a little bit more and to the faster you know, project. But, but we didn't take bids on this. I'm really having trouble with it. Uh, the consequence is we're going to lose about two or three months and make our staff work. Well, I would suggest that just for the board's consideration is if we're, if we are going to go back out and to uh, do a RFP process on this, that we retain the objective of doing a large and consolidated amount of work. So that you will be looking at a dollar value contract that might be more than you've been used to in the past couple of years, and there's a reason for that. 
Um, we have, I mean, we have identified work that is even, you know, we could add to this. So I mean, we can we can bring you, you know, probably a well, ten to twelve mile chunk of work that will that will meet your needs of or the objectives of going out for an RFP. I'm not afraid of the dollar amount. Yeah, but it would be my only point is so strategically we're we're all agreeing that we need to pick up the pace of our capital program, right? Yes. So the way we do that is by doing larger consolidated projects that are much more efficient. So my only my only point is if, if we do go out for an RFP, let's do it with an eye towards a large consolidated chunk of work. And I would ask that maybe if we explicitly include it next time, do you want to not go out every time you do a design project and start over, or do you want to offer essentially a multi-year contract from the get-go, from the get-go, so that you have a vision? Can we, can we just back up and stay on this agenda item? This is the be here now thing. To bring in, I'm going to do this and that and more, I think there's an agenda item what we're talking about, we're trying to come to a vote. I'm going to support Tom. You know, this is just like, it's too, it's too big of a contract. I don't feel comfortable about it. There's no numbers. Maybe we could bid it down in $500, I mean $500,000. We don't really know that. And I hear you, Greg, I'm totally for that. I don't know if you can get project out. It's almost like, like 10 years of work. But you know, no, 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 fine. or however you want to project it out, that's fine. But I think right now, there's, there's, we're trying to get to a vote on this one item, and I'm not going to support it. I think they're a great company and they've done great work, but the state audit payment and dingus, that's one of the issues. And to wait a couple of months, you know, it might be somewhat of more work for staff. But to me, it's like really looking um, transparent and clean for the community. So I don't know, that's where I'm at. And, to, and council saying, you know, if we get sued. And we have been sued by construction companies. We have to. So you know we can so for the recommendation we can uh, approve the contract we can take another action and we can take no action and what I would be thinking is going out for our piece with, with the same with the same project same big, pro big same project. contract same yeah. bid but put it out or however I mean I, I would say however staff wants to you know, package and bring it back to us. All we're saying is, and for my part too, it was a half a million dollar contract to start with, and this is 1.4, and given all the other environmental factors that we're talking about. All the review we're doing. So, um, take no action at this time. Feels good. No, <laughs> Feels like the action would be to instruct staff to go out to more. I'll, I'll, I'll put it in the form of motion that we, all, that we, that we request staff to, to, to put an RFP out for this project and, uh, and, uh, and bring the bid results back. What do you think? 60 days? Uh, uh, we we that would, uh, out in, in a few days? Give them 30 days? It takes a month to put our appeal on the street. And Does it? Give them a month to, uh, to uh, we'll probably see this in uh, July. Like okay. That. Okay. So, okay. It's no reflection on here because everybody thinks you did a good job. <laughs> Okay, we'll, we'll uh, take it out to RFP and then we'll bring the results back to the board. You didn't have a second, I don't know if there's a second. Okay, okay so uh, any further discussion? All in favor? One five. Aye. Aye. Two open to the public. Did you open it to the public? I did. I asked you the did? public. Yeah. I can't remember. I don't see it. That's what happens. It's really late. Well, thank you for your. We're going to have to finish up these things. I just want to talk briefly about the agenda. So she's not here. And um, I've been asking for this for months. But instead of getting what, was, what I asked for, I didn't quite get what I, <laughs> what I asked for. She says work plan remainder. So the way to do this is to have what you present, and this is human resources. You present, when she first came on board, you have her contract, she had her time frame and all the stuff, but she was going to have this, this, and done. So now I'm not really sure what I'm looking at. I, 
I'm assuming this is what she wrote us, but I really don't know, and I'm going to have to go through my piles of stuff before. Can we put this as an agenda item and have her here at the beginning of the meeting? Because a lot of the stuff I just can't track. Sure. I just, there's, it's just uh, shaky and the numbers I just can't track. And I'm just now looking at this first page. We had medical leave management, 27 events. Right, so it's that's a reason big. Right, and that's, that's what we've been I trying know. to say to you guys. I guess I never heard they're doing this stuff. A, we don't bring it to you, Pam. It's day to day human resources. It's happening week in and week out. We have people coming on FMLA. We have, they are handling human resources for the district. It's a service. It goes on week in and week out. It's not a deliverable where they bring us a package and we're done. They're handling all kinds of day-to-day -day detailed staff needs. That's what, when they say events, that's what they're doing. Right, so that's, and then I appreciate, yeah. um, is it Kathleen? Yeah, I appreciate her comment about what, what are, for these different things, what, how are we dividing up this $200,000? I, I don't know, I don't have a clue, I don't know how many policies. It says here, drafted policies, I, so this long list on page two. Right. I mean that just right. gives so you none a of sense. them are done. No, a number of them are are basically uh, drafted, and we haven't been able to um, uh, bring them through yet because of, we, we just don't have the capacity to bring them to the board right now. Those are. This gives you a sense. I mean, there's not one aspect of the HR administrative background of the district practically that we're not ending up, you know, doing work on. So that's just a list of, of, of policy updates that they've been, that they've been working on. Okay, so that's uh, just So my... we will bring you, like, I think uh, uh, this was meant to be responsive a little bit to your request for, you know, right. what are they doing? Right, and, and this is some of the things that they are I'm doing. assuming this is 13, 14, and 14, 15. Right. Um, when is this, when is the, when is her contract up, or their contract up? Uh, I think it runs through the end of this fiscal year currently. June? Correct. June, okay. That's all I have to say. The budget shows 200,000 to another year. Right. I mean, you guys, I'm going to ask for an RFP. Let's read going by the way here. <laughs> 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 oh, great. <laughs> I had one. Uh, I was going to ask that we adjourn tonight in the memory of the mulatto worker from Major Gelati who was killed on a job just south of Petaluma. You know, Major Gelati does a lot of work for us, and, and a young young man was killed on that job. Uh, and, and I went online and I found the name. And that's why I was. Oh, I've got it right here. His his name was um, uh, Jared Overbeal. Over O V E R F I E L D. And if we can adjourn this meeting tonight in his memory and write and write the family and Major Gelati explaining that we adjourn tonight in the memory of their, their employee and, and their family member. And, uh, and offer our condolences. So.